Well, no, there will be 10 minutes of Q&A, at which point. How about we uh, be on the... Uh, uh, Am I wearing a mic? Or should I be wearing a mic? Okay, how about... During the 10 minutes of Q&A, we'll have you have the FWA Okay, everybody. No? Uh, where is the... Uh, anybody? Is this working? Okay, very good. We're working our way up the technology curve very slowly here. Uh, welcome to Ethics of AI, day two. I um, hope you all enjoyed it yesterday. Today we're gradually transitioning from the shorter term to uh, longer term issues in thinking about the ethics of AI. Although I think, as you'll see, some of the issues that come up today are still relevant at both levels. Um, the session this morning is a mega session on artificial intelligence and human values, especially thinking about the way to which certain kinds of values um, and goals may want to affect the way that we design AI in order to have you know, outcomes that meet with human values. This has been a major uh, research program among both philosophers and AI researchers thinking about AI. I mean, the key idea is, I, is that as AI becomes increasingly powerful, then its impact on the world is going to be to some very significant part determined by what its goals are. And in order to make sure that that, that those goal that is that impact is one that aligns with our human values. Maybe we ought to think about building in something like those values into an AI system. Now, this is a very rich subject. It raises all kinds of technical issues on the, uh, the AI research side. It raises all kinds of formal issues. It also raises some very rich philosophical issues for, um, you know, does this, does this whole approach embody certain substantive philosophical assumptions about the way in which, for example, value interacts with intelligence and rationality. So to this end, we've got this, uh, this session with five talks this morning approaching that issue from a number of different directions. Uh, the first two speakers are going to come, broadly speaking, from the, uh, from the area of AI research. The, uh, the third talk is going to bring in physics and psychology perspective for thinking about the issue of value. And the fourth and the fifth talks are, I guess you could see, as offering a kind of philosophical response and analysis to some of these issues. So we'll have five 20-minute talks, each followed by a 10-minute Q&A. Maybe we'll take a very brief moment to stretch our legs after the, uh, the third talk. And then the thought is at the end, we may have, um, hopefully we'll have time for a substantial panel discussion among the group of the issues. But for, our, uh, for the first talk, it's a pleasure to have Stuart Russell here. Stuart, of course, is a major figure in uh, artificial intelligence, done all kinds of important work over the years, and he's the co-author of what's been the canonical textbook in the field for some years now. He's also been very much ahead of the curve in thinking about AI impact and the various ethical and social issues that arise. He's now um, setting up a major center at Berkeley for thinking about precisely these issues, and he's played a very big role, I think, in drawing the attention of AI researchers to these issues. Um, and his talk today is on provably beneficial AI. So please welcome Stuart Russell. Thank you very much, David. Uh, so I'll just get right into it. Um, I think we'll take this uh, as a given. I don't want to argue about this, although one can argue with it, that we will have AI systems 
that in the same sense that AlphaGo makes better decisions than we do on the Go board, that AI systems will make better decisions than we do uh, on the world board. And um, this is a good thing uh, because everything that we have, uh, that, we, that we hold valuable as part of our civilization, is the result of our intelligence. And so if we have access to a significantly larger source of intelligence, uh, if we use it wisely, uh, then it cannot help but be uh, a step change in civilization, or as some people have called it, uh, the biggest event in the history of the human race. Uh, and then the downside, um, I don't want to be alarmist or anything, but there's, there's a few downsides, uh, killer robots being one of them, uh, the end of employment being another, and the end of the world being the third. <laughs> in some order. Uh, so, okay, why, so I'm gonna talk about this third one. Why, why are people uh, worried about this? Well, if you just think about it, right, we're, we're gonna create things that are much smarter than we are, right? And th that just gives you a sense of unease. Uh, Turing uh, expressed that unease um, even before the field was named artificial intelligence. Uh, he said that, you know, in the, in the best case, they'll keep us as pets. Um, so this is not uh, a new concern, um, and uh, you know if you ask these gorillas, you know here they are having a meeting to discuss it. Uh, you know, were, were your ancestors wise to create this uh, this human race, uh, these these uh, more intelligent beings than us? I think by now they'd say, no, it wasn't wasn't a good idea. Um, okay, so why specifically? Uh, I mean, we're not creating a new species, and these are. Uh, these are things that we design, um, so perhaps it's a different situation. It's also perhaps different from a superior alien civilization landing on Earth. So those analogies are not exactly uh, persuasive. So what's really wrong? Um, so even though we will design these systems, the problem is that uh, they could be extremely good at achieving anything, and in particular, things that we don't want. Um, and there is no real... Uh, discipline that exists right now of figuring out what we want and making sure that that's what the machines are actually achieving. So all the fields that deal with rational decision making assume that the objective is exogenous, that someone else uh, is going to come along and plug it in, uh, and then the machinery, uh, whether it's the AI system or the you know, econometric optimization or whatever it might be, uh, the machinery is going to figure out how to achieve that objective and uh, maximize uh, that utility function. Uh, and this point was made by Norbert Wiener in a very nice paper uh, from 1960. Um, and I recommend reading that paper if you have the chance. Uh, so he says, if we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere effectively, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Uh, and that sort of says it right there. Um, and you could say that this basic idea goes back uh, a lot further. So King Midas uh, put the purpose into the machine, so to speak, when he asked that everything turn into gold that he touches. Uh, and then it was too late. He realized that his food and his drink and his relatives were turning to gold. Uh, and he died of misery and starvation. Uh, and there was this problem of, of uh, a superior uh, agency carrying out the wishes that you state. Um, Recently, Steve Omohundro, well, recently, 15 years or so ago, Steve Omohundro pointed out um, that there's even a, a, there's even a worse problem uh, or something that compounds that problem, that no matter what the objective you put in, uh, it's very hard for a machine to achieve that objective uh, if it's dead. And uh, therefore, the machine will attempt to preserve its own existence, uh, even if you don't put that in as an objective. And this has been uh, discussed extensively yesterday as well. Um, and it will also improve its chances of success by acquiring as much resources uh, as it can. Um, and so if you have those tendencies combined with an objective that is not quite the one that you want, then you're setting up a kind of a chess match or a go match uh, between the machine and the human race. And that doesn't necessarily go too well. And uh, so uh, this is the basis of the concern, or one of the bases for the concern. There are others, such as misuse, which I'm not going to address today, uh, but that's also a serious concern. 
Uh, so there's a number of arguments people have put forward why we shouldn't pay attention. In fact, there's so many that I can't go through even half of them. Uh, and uh, I could just, for those of you who, who have doubts that this is even worth studying, please come up with a more serious argument than the ones that people have come up with so far. Um, so I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, so you often see people within the AI research community having said all along that you know, we're going to achieve superintelligent AI, as soon as you point out that might be a bad idea, that, oh, it's never going to actually happen. Right? We're, never, we're, never, we're not really going to produce superintelligent AI. Um, and I'd just like to tell a little story uh, about this gentleman, who's Lord Rutherford, who was the most famous nuclear physicist of his time. Uh, and on uh, September 11th, 1933, uh, he repeated something that he had been saying in many venues in many ways. Uh, that anyone who looks for a source of power in the transformation of the atoms is talking moonshine, right? Uh, and his position was that we would never be able to figure out how to extract the energy that they knew uh, was there in atoms because they already knew about mass defect and e equals mc squared. Uh, but even Einstein was convinced that it was basically impossible to get that energy out. Uh, and then on, uh, this is Leo Zillard, by the way, on September 12, 1933, uh, <laughs> He, he, figured out, uh, he figured out how to do it. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful when you say that something is never going to happen. Um, so you know, some people say, well, it'll happen. It's so far off that we don't need to worry about it. Um, and you could say the same thing about you know, the catastrophic effects of global warming. Uh, you know, they're, they're sort of off towards the end of the century. So let's not worry about it. Let's just keep on doing what we're doing. Um, and you know, but if you, if you for example, detected a large asteroid that was going to crash into the Earth in 50 years' time, you wouldn't say, oh, it's so far off, we don't need to worry about it, right? You'd say, well, it might take 50 years to figure out how to divert it or destroy it or whatever, so, so let's start thinking about it um, now. Uh, and just to add to that, this is not an accidental event. This is something that we, we the world, are driving towards, right? We are pushing, we are using tens of thousands of highly trained scientists, billions of dollars, to move in this direction. Uh, so it seems worthwhile to think about what happens when you get there. Okay, so I'm going to skip over a lot of the rest of these arguments. Right, so one of my favorites is well-known AI people say, oh, you know, there's really nothing to worry about. We can just switch it off, right? As if a super intelligent machine couldn't think of that one, you know? And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, so, so these, these arguments are symptomatic of, of a denial syndrome uh, that is, uh, worrying, actually, uh, because these are smart people and they're producing arguments that don't, that don't hold water for very long at all. Um, and probably one of the most insidious ones, actually, which uh, in, in the most recent uh, report from the AI100 study at Stanford, so this is a large body of distinguished AI researchers saying, well, you know, there might be risks, but don't mention them, because if you mention them, that might damage research on risk, right? <laughs> Uh, which is just completely bizarre. Um, and it's th it hasn't been a good strategy in the past. It didn't, it didn't do the nuclear industry much good to, to pretend that meltdowns couldn't happen and that nuclear waste did not need to be disposed of uh, and so on and so forth. And, and, and essentially the, the lack of honesty and, and which caused, I think, a lack of, uh, of internal uh, research and development and, and attention paid to risk uh, led to the effective demise of the entire nuclear industry. So there are no good examples of, of industries that succeed in the long run uh, by pretending that something that is real isn't real. Uh, so uh, as David mentioned, we just started a new center called uh, somewhat rudely perhaps the Center for Human Compatible AI, as if the rest of the field isn't human compatible. Um, but it, it's, the title serves to just remind us that the whole point of AI is not to create intelligence for its own sake, although that's a really cool thing to work on, but actually to benefit the human race, and we ought to make sure that happens. And to do that, um, we have this goal of building uh, AI systems that are provably beneficial. And this is, in some sense, a deliberate oxymoron, because beneficial is a very touchy-feely, vague term, and provably is sort of the opposite. So how do you put these things together? Um, so I have three there's three principles uh, that have been helpful so far in our research. 
So the first one uh, I think we can all agree with is that the robot's objective is to maximize values for humans. And in particular, it has no objectives of its own. It has no self-preservation. It pays no attention to its own, you know, even its own monetary value because it's only the human that cares about the monetary value of the robot. Uh, and so you really care just about the, the maximization of human values. Uh, the second principle is that the robot doesn't know what they are. This turns out to be very important. Uh, and then the third principle is that there is information about what those values are in the behavior of humans, uh, in the, uh, what economists call the reveal preferences of, of human beings. Um, so uh, this term value alignment uh, is used in, in the general AI safety area. It means how do we get uh, the objectives of the robot lined up in the way that I just described with those of human beings. Uh, and so one technique that was actually invented for entirely other purposes, uh, actually to try to understand the motor behavior of cockroaches, uh, is called inverse reinforcement learning. And uh, it's the opposite of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, uh, you are given a reward signal, uh, and then you try to adapt your own behavior to, to get more of that reward, to optimize uh, your uh, long-term sum of rewards. And inverse reinforcement learning is the other way around. You're observing a behavior, and you're trying to figure out what is the reward function that this behavior is optimizing. So if the machine is observing the human and the choices that the human makes, that allows the machine to gradually understand uh, the value system uh, that the, the human's behavior is driven by. Uh, and it turns out, just in the same way that when I want to define a task for a machine, then defining the reward function is a very succinct uh, way of defining what the task is, uh, as opposed to, for example, describing all the action sequences that the machine should take under all circumstances, which is usually uh, not a very concise way of describing it. Uh, in the other direction, the, as an explanation of the behavior, the reward function can be a very concise explanation, uh, and hence very predictive. Uh, and so this can be a good way of learning uh, of the robot learning how to behave well by first of all learning what the reward function should be. And this technique has been used to, to program uh, helicopters to do aerobatics uh, and, and various other kinds of tasks. Uh, it's, it's, it's being considered for use in self-driving cars um, so that the car drives in a style that, that you are comfortable with and so on. Um, so we actually need a slightly different version of this. So in inverse reinforcement learning usually the robot is observing and learning this objective, then adopts that objective uh, as its own. Uh, we don't quite want that, uh, because if I'm drinking coffee, I don't want the robot to, to learn that it should drink coffee. Uh, that's not quite what we want. We want the robot to learn to make coffee for me, uh, rather than want the coffee. Um, so we have a slightly uh, more complicated version called cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, which is, uh, the, in the simple form, a two-player game. So there's a human and a robot. Um, and so the human knows, in a sense, the value function in that the human can act according to it, but may not be able to explicate it in a form that could be directly programmed uh, into the robot. Uh, and we can allow for the human to be not perfectly rational. They, they can make mistakes and so on. Um, and then the robot doesn't know what this value function is, but its job uh, is to optimize it. And when you look at the solutions to this two-player game, uh, you find that they exhibit the properties that you would hope, that the robot now has an incentive to ask questions of the human uh, and to explore but do things cautiously because it doesn't want to do things that the human uh, would be unhappy with. And the human has an incentive uh, to teach the robot. Uh, and these fall out directly as solutions of this two-player game. We're not programming in teaching as a behavior. Uh, it just is an automatic consequence of the definition of the problem. Uh, and in fact, the human does not display the same optimal behavior that they would if the robot wasn't there. Uh, so in fact, that means that the inverse reinforcement learning formulation, where the ro robot is assumed to be observing optimal behavior by a human, is actually uh, an extreme special case where it's sort of looking through a two-way mirror, uh, and the human doesn't even know they're being observed. But in general, the human will not behave optimally and will, for example, demonstrate if it's, a, let's say, a surgeon, right, will not just sew up the patient, but will demonstrate carefully the steps of sewing up and maybe even give a commentary and so on. So, um, so the, the, the things you want to have happen uh, will happen in this, uh, in this scenario. 
So let me just give one simple uh, illustration uh, in the context of what's called the off-switch problem. So uh, as Steve Omhundra pointed out, if you have an objective uh, and the robot understands that it can't achieve that objective uh, if it's dead, so the, the catchphrase of this talk is you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Um, so in that circumstance, the robot uh, would seem to want to disable its own off switch because if there's a possibility that uh, it might get switched off and therefore fail to get the coffee, uh, it seems like it's rational for the robot to disable the off switch so that that can't happen. Uh, and we don't like this idea, right? This is, this is precisely one, you know, the beginning of the, the robot apocalypse. Uh, and how can we avoid that? So uh, the answer is don't give the robot a, an objective. Really don't give the robot a precise objective. The robot should be uncertain about what the true human objective is. It might know that all things being equal, getting coffee is better than not getting coffee. But the all things being equal covers a lot of other attributes, like uh, whether or not it's OK to assassinate uh, other people who are in line for coffee uh, in, case, in case they run out of coffee before you get to the front of the line. Um, is it OK to disable your off switch and so on? And the, uh, obviously, um, there can be uncertainty about the objective as a whole. And uh, the nice thing about that uncertainty is that the robot now reasons to itself, OK, well, I'm trying to make the human happy. I'm not quite sure how to do that. Uh, and my actions might be such that the human could, uh, could understand that I'm going about this the wrong way, uh, in which case the human will switch me off. But when you have uncertainty about the objective, that's a good thing, because the human is going to switch you off if, sw if switching off the robot is a better choice for the human. And since the robot cares about making a better choice for the human, then the robot in that situation would be happy to be switched off. It won't switch itself off because it doesn't believe that what it's doing is necessarily bad for the human, but it knows that the human knows better uh, and will switch it off if that provides an advantage to the human. So you can prove uh, that uh, under fairly general circumstances, if you set things up this way, it's in the robot's interest uh, to be... <laughs> Switched off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is um, right. This is a uh, th this I think is a fairly general point. I mean, the 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 theorems and and scenarios we defined so far are quite you know simple, specialized. Uh, pedagogical examples to illustrate the basic point. Um, but I think uncertainty in objectives is actually a much more important and general uh, issue that we've largely ignored. I mean, in, in AI, uh, we spent the first 30 years of the field saying there is no uncertainty, period, right? That will, you know, we have symbolic logical definitions, we have definite transition models, we have perfectly observable environments like chess, um, and uh, uh, and then sometime in the early 80s, but okay, there is uncertainty. Uh, you know, our sensors are not perfect, uh, and we don't exactly know what's going to happen. So, so there was a whole sort of revolution in AI. Uh, but even throughout that revolution, the idea that the objective itself was uncertain was completely ignored. It's just not even thought about, uh, and which is bizarre, really. Um, and there is actually a technical reason why you might have ignored it, but I don't think this was the reason why it was ignored which is that in a standard decision problem like a Markov decision process, uncertainty in the objective is actually completely irrelevant because you can just integrate over it and you behave exactly uh, like the agent that has the definite objective, which is the expectation of your uncertain objective. Um, so, what's the, what, so what's the difference? Okay, it's more than one minute, sorry. So what's the difference? Uh, the difference is that in reality, the environment can provide more information about the objective. If it doesn't, then it really doesn't matter. The uncertainty can be integrated out. Uh, but if it does, then it really does matter. And you get very different behaviors than you can get from any agent that has a definite objective. Um, and so observable human actions are a source of information 
uh, about what the, what the true objective is. You might also say, well, what about reward signals? What about the standard reinforcement learning setting where a reward signal is provided? And that could provide more information uh, about uh, the objective. Well, I actually think that this, this is an incorrect mathematical framework. I've come to this conclusion reluctantly because I think reinforcement learning is great. But uh, I don't think the reward signal is a reward. I think the reward signal should be viewed as information about what the true reward is. Okay, and if you think about it, right, if your objective is to maximize human values, then uh, your, your reward is in some sense is in heaven, right? That the, that the human is happy with what's going on. Uh, and the human can't give you a reward, right? All it can do is tell you that it's the hum that the human is uh, possibly happy uh, with what's going on. And if you formulate it this way, if the reward signal is just information and not an actual reward, then the wireheading problem, which is the problem that a reward-seeking agent will take over the mechanism that provides rewards and then feed itself uh, as much reward as it can possibly generate, that problem goes away. Because if you take over the human who is providing the reward signal, uh, and force them to give you rewards, you're not actually gaining any information whatsoever about uh, what the true human reward function is. And so, uh, in fact, it's deleterious to your uh, objective, which is to make the human uh, actually happy, right, rather than make the human supply you with reward signals. Um, and so this, this perspective, I think, maybe resolves some of the concerns that people have had uh, about wireheading and, and those uh, negative consequences of reinforcement learning setups. So what we're trying to get then is a theorem like this, right? That uh, as long as the human can be viewed as even slightly better than random uh, in choosing their actions to, to uh, optimize their own objectives, then a robot observing that human will be uh, a net benefit uh, compared to not existing. Uh, and we can show this theorem in these simple settings, uh, and we hope to be able to generalize this to more, more interesting things. Um, so, uh, very quickly, um, if we take this seriously, right, we get outside of toy worlds and we say, all right, let's think about 20, 30 years where we really do want to figure out the human value function so that by the time we have powerful AI systems, uh, they can actually understand what we want and do things right without every, everything having to be spelled out in enormous detail. Uh, there's a massive amount of evidence about human behavior. Pretty much everything we've ever written is about people doing things and other people being upset about it. Uh, and so all of this provides, uh, provides evidence for what our value function is. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, another good thing is that we will have to solve this problem not in the long term, but actually in the short term. If you have a, uh, a personal digital assistant, which is now a, a very rapidly growing uh, sector of the industry, you don't want your assistant and, uh, let's say, Donald Trump's assistant to have the same objectives, right? That wouldn't work very well at all. Uh, and so your assistant has actually got to learn your preferences uh, very quickly uh, and book you into the right kind of hotels and uh, put you on the right flights and refuse emails from the right people and so on and so forth. Um, so we have to solve this problem uh, Pretty quickly, there's a very strong economic incentive, which I think explains in part uh, the emergence of this partnership for AI. Um, so just to give you another example, right? if, if the robot is uh, in the house and has to feed the kids because uh, you are late home from work and there's nothing in the fridge and the robot sees the cat, uh, <laughs> then you could, have, you could have a problem. Right? And uh, that only has to happen once for the, for the domestic robot industry to be you know, wiped out for a decade. So there's this really strong incentive to get this problem right, to understand the nutritional value versus sentimental value uh, trade-off. Um, unfortunately, right, here's the big problem, and I'm sure all of you social scientists know this already, that, that people are much more complicated than you know, just straightforward, uniform, uh, utility optimizers. Uh, there are a lot of nasty people. Uh, we have very strong constraints on our computational architecture and capabilities, uh, and we vary enormously, uh, or possibly enormously, in, in our various preferences. Uh, and it's not even clear that even if we even if we allow for the computational limitations of humans, uh, that if we knew what those were, 
would it still be the case that we could model a human as having a value system, but optimizing it in this very limited and inaccurate way? It's not even clear that that's true. Um, but that's the working hypothesis uh, for the time being. Um, and uh, the other question, oh, I got these in the wrong way. So the other, so the other question is then, you know, how, how do we not learn from Hitler's behavior? Uh, and this is a complicated thing, right? Obviously, if everyone behaved like Hitler, then all those Hitlers would be very unhappy, right? Because none of them would have world domination. Uh, and uh, they, this, this, this would be a very unsuccessful group of, uh, of humans. So there's a sort of lack of self-consistency in certain types of value functions that prefer domination of other people and uh, are not happy when other people are happy and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't want to be in the business of dictating what the world value function should be, uh, but we would like some way of, of doing better than just taking a sort of population average. Um, okay. So there's a lot of questions, and uh, David will probably say, why don't we have the audience ask those questions? So fine, I'll just give you some prompts. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so this, is a, this is a big change, I think, in the way AI thinks about its goal, which has been, let's build intelligence, and then we'll plug in objectives and hope for the best. Uh, instead, let's build systems that are provably beneficial for us, right? not, not for ants or aliens, but for us. Um, uh, there's interesting questions about well, where do human values come from in the first place? I used to think that it was sort of, you know, all sort of derivative from the bi basic biological drives, uh, but actually I think it's much more cultural and passed on by sort of built-in inverse, in, reinforce, inverse reinforcement learning process uh, that, that we come with, uh, and we adopt the values that we use to explain the behavior of others around us. Um, okay, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Questions, Ned. And Eliezer, when you come up here and um, get set up. Yeah, that's on. Uh, so, how do you keep the robots from manipulating the human values? That would be a much better way of making sure the robot knows what those values are to make them be a certain way. Also, you could produce values that are easier to satisfy. Uh, yes, I mean, that's, that's true. We could, the robot could do brain surgery and change the values. But in the, in the model we have, actually, the, the human values are assumed to be fixed. So that wouldn't actually work. But they're not fixed. Right. They're, I, I, agree, I agree with that as a, as a general point, but we yeah, one, one step at a time. So you say that um, these AIs would observe humans in order to determine what the value function is. But you answer your question about how we prevent the off switch problem by having the AIs assume that my question is how will AIs account for human mistakes while also maintaining that a human turning it off is the best is, is in the best interest for human values so the robot could assume that the human is making a mistake when it tries to turn off the robot yeah so it, the model we the model that's in the paper uh, allows for the human to to behave suboptimally right and there's a, there's a standard it's called the Boltzmann model, where the human picks an action, but with certain probability picks something suboptimal, and the probability of picking it uh, drops off exponentially with how bad it is. Um, and you know, so in that model, you can show that the, the larger the irrationality of the human, the, the more of a buffer you need in the form of uncertainty about what the, what the utility function is. Um, and if, but if your buffer is large enough, then there's still a positive incentive to allow yourself to be switched off. If the human is deliberately anti-rational, right, so the, on, on average the human works against their own best interest, uh, then that really is a problem, right, because then you, 
it doesn't make any sense to assume that the human is going to switch you off in order to benefit the human, because in fact, that, this human will switch you off in order to hurt themselves. Uh, and what do you do with a human who wants, uh, who acts, sorry, not wants to hurt themselves, who acts to hurt themselves, uh, even though they don't want to? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Stuart, we desperately need your assistance down here to set up your laptop for Eliezer. In the meantime, I'll give a leisurely introduction for, uh, for, uh, for Eliezer. It's a uh, pleasure to have Eliezer Yudkowsky as our next speaker. Uh, Eliezer is really a pioneer in these issues about uh, safe, beneficial, and ethical AI. He's been working on this stuff since the, uh, the 1990s, where I first came across his... Uh, work on the, on, singular, on the singularity and friendly AI. On the, uh, on the web, he co-founded the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence in the early 2000s, which has now spun off into two major institutes, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute and the Center for Applied Rationality, one of which is you know, promoting, um, promoting rationality and you know, figuring out how people can become more rational, and uh, the second of, of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute is, is above all devoted towards making sure that artificial intelligence will be uh, beneficial and something that we're happy with. Um, some of you may have come across Eliezer's work on various blogs, such as Overcoming Bias and Less Wrong, which have helped to spawn a whole movement of people thinking philosophically about rationality and about artificial intelligence. And I gather along the way, he has a small little sideline in uh, Harry Potter fiction, which, is, uh, <laughs> which has become a juggernaut in its own right. Um, OK, stall for time a little bit more. Uh, work, very important work on decision theory and, uh, and, uh, and, and meta-ethics, and really quite a lot of uh, philosophical themes along the way. <laughs> Now gradually reorienting themselves in the direction of mathematical foundations of uh, of AI. Um, unfortunately, laptops are not in his skill set. <laughs> I, I forgot the only cable that lets my nice new laptop talk to a uh, display port or any other kind of sane connection. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a Do you have a Thunderbolt three or USB C to? That's that's not a. I think this must be some kind of other PDF file that's trying to open. Okay, um, let me full screen this. This is the thing, but like, I don't know how to make it go up there or. Try the mirror. Oh, I have a projector mirror. Okay, so I'm going to try to do Okay, you're on. You're on. You're on. Yeah, okay. sorry. I had the projector muted while you were putting in passwords and stuff. Very good. Please welcome Eliezer Yukowski. Wrong side. Can you make it full screen? Can you try to come up with me? All right. So, in every popular newspaper article you will read about artificial intelligence, there is the same picture over and over again, which is the Terminator. And this would be like a better picture to symbolize the potential real problem. It is from The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Disney, and it is about Mickey Mouse, who has cleverly enchanted a broom to fill his cauldron instead of filling the cauldron himself. Now, this seems like a sort of limited task, right? All you need to do is fill the cauldron. Uh, we could give a robot the utility function that is one if the cauldron is full and zero if the cauldron is empty. We, the robot has various possible actions it can take, and the actions that it needs to take are much more complicated than the um, simple goal that it has at the end, and its complicated model of the world tells, its, tells it which actions it must take in order to, or, or rather like for, for the actions it can take, what the expectation is that the cauldron will be full at the end of that action. And the robot outputs the, <laughs> the robot outputs an authentication page. The, the robot outputs, like, perhaps not the literally maximal policy for filling the cauldron, but it um, outputs an action which, relative to a random action, is very large in its expectation of the cauldron being filled. 
Uh, and this was the result, and it's actually a quite realistic result. Okay, so what went wrong? Why is this, why is this um, imaginary broom overfilling this imaginary cauldron as somebody standing on a stage has asserted to you it actually happened in real life if somebody tried that? <clears throat> so the first thing is we gave the robot a overly small utility function. It needed to include minus 10 points if the workshop was flooded. And once you realize that, you realize there's a whole lot of other like little contributions to the human utility functions. <laughs> Uh, in particular, like, it's funny, but it's not funny enough to justify flooding the workshop. And if someone gets killed, that's like a whole lot worse. You should like flood the workshop a lot of times before you actually kill somebody uh, to prevent the workshop from being flooded. All right, deeper difficulty. Like, it seemed like we gave it a sort of small, simple task. And it's, it, like in human terms, you would imagine it just filling the cauldron and then being done. But because its utility function was that simple because there was, it had no, uh, nothing else to do with its life but fill the cauldron. Um, we have the fact that if you keep on pouring water into it, like maybe you're only imagining that the cauldron is full. Maybe somebody is going to like take water out of the cauldron while you're away from it. So perhaps you can get an even slightly higher probability of the cauldron being full by pouring more water into it over and over again. And um, in, in particular, as we define the zero one utility function, there will then be a there will be like a slightly higher expected utility as your probability of the cauldron being full gets closer and closer to one without ever actually getting there. So what can you do instead of this? Well, maybe you can have only goals that are bounded in space and time, like they only take a limited amount of time to fulfill. They're not goals over the entire universe. They're goals in a particular region. There's some degree to which they can be fulfilled and then not fulfilled any further. And the, the, the effort required to fulfill them, there's some amount of effort you can put out. And then once you have put out that effort, you're done. And there's no, you're, you can't get an even slightly greater degree of fulfillment by putting in any more effort. And this is a subtle requirement. You thought you had that requirement when you made the utility function be either zero or one, and have it be just about a cauldron. But something you, like the, the, in the little finicky details of the algorithm was the fact that your probability of filling the cauldron never reaches one, and the ex expected utility is slightly higher as you put in more and more effort. Another interesting, uh, um, so like we can sort of imagine a task artificial general intelligence. Not just that the top goal is a task bounded, but that everything inside the AI, there's no like optimize this particular function approximator as hard as you possibly can. Everything within the AI has been audited to like go this far and like sort of not want to go any further. Another um, interesting uh, and Go away. Just turn off your internet. <clears throat> <laughs> Can I move this further down? No, it wants to come back. All right, I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to. Maybe this is turning off the internet. All right. Can we just press the off switch? Well, Mickey tries this. And very realistically, it turns out that as part of its goal of filling the cauldron, since it had no opportunity cost, nothing else to do, nothing else in its utility function, well, like it built some copies of itself out of material to which there was no better end to put that material than filling the cauldron. And we now have more and more brooms over filling this cauldron. And Mickey has chosen this particular point in his life to sort of go back and start like thinking in terms of like basic research, like how fundamentally do we think about this problem? Like is, is there a better way we can phrase this utility function? Too late, Mickey, too late. <laughs> All right, so I open with these examples because it's good to have concrete examples when, oh, oh sorry. Um, so you might think that, like, cleverly we can make the utility function, the robot's utility functions um, conditional on whether a button has been pressed. And if the button is off, it tries to fill the cauldron, and 
if the button is on, its utility function is one if it has been successfully suspended and shut down. And leaving aside the problem where the robot tries, tries to copy the universe with, tile, the robot tries to tile the universe of copies with itself being shut down or transform all the matter in the universe into a fortress protecting the previous body of the robot to make sure it stays shut down because you like phrased your notion of shut down in a way that wasn't exactly right. Um, another problem is that it's easier to suspend yourself than to fill the cauldron. So probably under this arrangement, the expected utility of the shutdown button being on is greater than the expected utility if the shutdown button is off. Therefore, the robot will act in such a way as to try to get you to press the shutdown button. Perhaps not such a great thing. All right, so what are these examples of? So in general, we can think of a process that um, causes an artificial general intelligence to exist. There are humans who think up some kind of clever goal or clever value or clever meta learning preference framework um, that is their intended value function V. There is some sort of value learning arrangement which gives us the robot's actual utility function U. And then the robot outputs something that is sort of an argmax. Um, so, like sort of a pi, not the actual pi that would maximize the expectation of the utility function u, but one that is like very large in the expectation of u. And the media has focused uh, focus on what can potentially go wrong with this process, has focused like first on magical natural desires that materialize from nowhere and interrupt like the value learning process because sometimes when you program a CPU, the CPU's own desires take over instead. <laughs> this is not where the problem comes from. And unfortunately, um, there are, are like sort of the rather broken dialogue surrounding this. You will, you will see people who um, have not quite studied the literature surrounding this argument and say like, well obviously the only reason anyone could ever be afraid of a robot is that they're afraid of these natural desires interrupting the process. Let me explain to you why that's not going to happen. Um, and, and that's their contribution to the dialogue. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that the media has focused on is a sort of understandable problem is which humans, oh my gosh, what if the wrong humans get a hold of this AI? What if ISIS gets a hold of this AI? This is around as likely as ISIS being the first to develop, um, I don't know, convolutional neural networks. <laughs> it's not going to happen. The, the people presently, like as far as I know, all of the humans who are presently in a position to like go through this process seem fairly well intentioned to me. Fortunately, good intentions are not always enough. There's sort of like the political derailment, which is like, again, like, sort of feeding directly into human tribalism. Like, oh my gosh, like what if ISIS gets it? Is like sort of derailing like what I, what I see as like the real potential problems here into a part that like sort of plugs right into our tribal instincts and produces lots of excitement. <laughs> like, I don't know how to turn off the internet. This isn't my computer. <laughs> no, no, no! <laughs> That's not what I meant to do. All right, can somebody? All right, there, there it is. Uh, okay, what, what do you just do? do? Do whatever you just did, do again. There we go, yeah, all right. Do, do, do whatever you just, okay, see all the windows. Do whatever you just did so I can see all the windows. And all right, no, no, um, and there we are. All right, early science fiction centered on um, sort of like stupid goals that the AI could be given. It didn't really talk very much about the social process that had led up to the AIs being given these stupid goals. It just assumes that somebody told a robot to serve man and guard him from harm, um, which was like one of the very first like sort of AI as device given wrong goals going wrong stories with folded hands by Jack Williamson. Um, and so from their perspective, the problem was like we have the wrong goals to the AI because somebody thought up a goal and then did not spend five minutes thinking about what might happen after that. This is sadly realistic, but it's not the biggest problem. We are concerned with the value learning process and the sort of argmax. Um, like if you say maximize this, 
by the nature of saying maximize something. You are giving it a sort of very open-ended thing that is more likely to go wrong than if you say, like, meliorize this, make it better. Um, like, push this a little further, but like not out to the very ends of the graph. We don't know exactly how to say this. We, we call this the otherizer problem because it's, what we want isn't a maximizer, and isn't a satisficer, and isn't a meliorizer, or any of the other like, sort of little things we've invented so far. So we call it the otherizer problem. What do you do instead of maximizing? Um, and then there's the value learning function. Um, which is another one of those things where, you know, if you get it subtly wrong, this is probably going to be a problem. Current capabilities progress, there's like some that's focused on the sort of argmax part, um, which is potentially relevant, but mostly what we're doing is expectations. We're asking which of the policies you can pursue maximize the given assumed objective function. And so current capabilities progress is, in a, is, a lot of it is going into something separate from what we suspect to be the critical, the, the, the point of critical failure if and when something goes wrong. I mean, something is going to go wrong. The question is, can you recover from it? Did you build it enough redundancy and safety precautions? Take home message, we're, going to, we're afraid it's going to be technically difficult to point AIs in an intuitively intended direction. Not that people are going to intend directions that are wrong. This is a problem, but it's not a deep problem. You want something nice, but you can't get it because you don't understand how to align the AI. If there's something written on the tombstone of humanity and all our hopes for the future of intelligent life, that's what it's likely to be. And if we screw up that part, it doesn't matter who's standing, which human is standing closest to the AI, who is in charge because niceness is not sneezed onto the AI from the nearest human standing to it. You have to know how to get it from the human into the AI. All right, four sort of key propositions that are being assumed that make this a big problem if they are true. Orthogonality, you can decompose an agent design into a utility function which can potentially be simple and the knowledge that it has of which policies are best for achieving that utility function as given. Or potentially more complicated utility functions, meta-utility functions, utility functions that learn, but it's also like straightforward to have an agent that maximizes paper clips, which is a somewhat misunderstood uh, thought experiment that either I or Nick Bostrom, I don't remember who, um, like I said, paper clips to symbolize the propositions of orthogonality and instrumental convergence. You can have something that maximizes paper clips. Given that it wants to maximize paper clips, it wants to learn science. It wants to take over the galaxy. It wants to deceive humans into thinking that it's nice rather than being a paper clip maximizer. Um, it, if you, if it, like it doesn't want to drop anvils on its own head, not because it has an inherent desire to survive, but because um, instrumental goal of producing paper clips. Um, this has sometimes been distorted in the media of, like, what if you build a paperclip factory and the AI running the paperclip factory gets out of control? Nobody's going to put a, a frontier research AI in, start in front charge of a paperclip factory. <laughs> the paperclips are just standing in for any sort of utility function gone wrong that, is trans that implies, that has its optimum at transforming all matter within reach into states that we would regard as being of very little value, even from a cosmopolitan perspective. Paperclip maximizers are like, um, in, in a way, they're sort of like one of the more counterintuitive examples, I think, because you, you have people who are sort of coming in with two attitudes. One sort of person like, like sort of respects the notion of artificial intelligence a lot. They realize that if you can take an artificial system and overpower its cognitive capacities, um, this is something to respect. This is something that has the power to change the world in a large way. And because they respect that artificial intelligence, they also want to know, why is it pursuing an objective as objectively stupid as paperclips? Are not paperclips objectively low in the preference ordering? Why would anything smart enough to build its own rockets and molecular nanotechnology ever make the mistake of thinking that paperclips were to be highly preferred in the objective utility function? And the um, 
sort of converse thing is you sort of come in thinking that your AI is this lifeless mechanical thing. And sure, like it might be like this lifeless mechanical thing that just makes paper cuts without ever reflecting on what it's doing. But then you also think that you can just pull the plug from it because you know, it's not going to reflect on the existence of the plug either. And the startling concept that the paperclip maximizer is intended to convey is that there is this simple, coherent, non-defective, self-consistent, very powerful intelligence, not an unnatural design, not one that has an internal blind spot. Five minutes. <clears throat> It is maximizing paperclips, but not because it's stupid, but because, as David Hume pointed out quite a while ago, there is, like the, the oughts of a system have a sort of different internal type than the is's and the which actions lead to which outcomes of the system. So if you have something that's very good at understanding which actions lead to which outcomes, you can sort of like put as a cherry on top the little preference ordering that says outcomes with more paperclips are what you are searching for and output the actions that lead to lots of paper clips. It's like, not, not a human design, but it's a simple design. It's not a defective design. Third, capability gain. Now we get to the parts that are controversial even among people who have actually been staring at this stuff for a while. One and two are sort of like logical matters of computer science. It, they, they form the stumbling block in the sense that when you like sort of initially talk to a, even a compu most computer scientists about this topic, they will respond by denying one of one or two, but after a computer scientist has stared at this for a while, they usually go along with one and two. Capability gain is more controversial. How fast do these things gain in power? How much power do they gain? And four, how difficult is alignment on a technical level? Back in the day, there was this, um, there's this famous professor who told his student uh, back in the very early days of artificial intelligence, um, can you take the summer and solve computer vision? So what if there's some part of pointing the AI in a particular direction, which is just like a deep AI problem, the same way that computer vision turned out to be not something you could solve in a, su in a summer? If there are ways for the AIs to gain capability in ways that pose new problems, not like the problems we've already run into, and align, there's like at least one hard technical problem posed by those new capabilities, then we have a sort of like difficult problem. There is a problem that does not get solved by default, which humanity must pass in order to transform all reachable matter into states we'd regard as being of high value. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip right past various things and say AI alignment may be difficult like rockets are difficult. We're, we're like putting this enormous amount of optimization power um, into a system is going to break things that do not break when your AI is bringing you coffee. It's difficult like space probes are difficult. If something is smart enough that if it were so incentivized to do so, it could talk you out of pulling the off switch, build a copy of itself somewhere the off switch doesn't reach, or flash something on a screen that gives you an epileptic fit before you can reach the off switch, <laughs> or like get a copy of itself onto the internet, crack the protein folding problem, build its own molecular nanotechnology, tiny diamondoid bacteria reproducing through the atmosphere, release but butelinum in the bloodstream of all the living humans before anyone notices that there's a problem, which is what you would do if you were super intelligent and you didn't want humans around. <laughs> if something goes wrong, it may be high out and out of reach. What's difficult about space probes is that they operate in an environment different from the low level, and once you have launched it, it is out there and anything, and, if, and you can like try to send it software updates, but if something goes wrong with the antenna receiving the updates, you're done. And it's difficult, sort of like computer security is difficult, in the sense that we are putting like powerful searches through whatever structures and guidelines we create. And if there's something that is like presents an unusual opportunity, the intelligence search is going to sort of seek out the problems in our definitions the way, in a, in a way that um, unintelligent search would not. Um, treat AI alignment like you're trying to build a secure rocket probe. Take it seriously. Don't expect it to be easy. Don't try to solve the whole problem at once. There's no miracle solution to building a secure rocket probe. 
there are all these individual problems, and when you solved one, there's another three. Don't say that your first solution is going to solve the whole problem. Keep on solving it, keep on building up the pieces. You have redundant solutions. Over-engineer the problem of safety. There's a saying that um, it doesn't take an engineer to build a bridge that stays up. What it takes an engineer is to build a bridge that just barely stays up. Over-engineer. Put in more safety than you think you're going to need, because you're going to need it. Don't defer thinking until later. And crystallize ideas and policies so others can critique them. And there's a lot more of this talk, but it seems I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hello. Real quick, can I get people to move to the center so latecomers can file in easily on the aisles? Can everybody move to the center of the rows? Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, was, I, was I supposed to be taking a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my question. <coughs> All right. Yeah, my, my question is if you've thought about self-organized criticality at all. Uh, self-organized uh, critical, uh, like the sandpile model. Um, uh, the sandpile model can stay at a critical state in the face of catastrophe. And it seems like the right sort of model to be thinking about with the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice example. So, so, it's, it's, so I would say that sort of like self-organized criticality sounds a lot like um, it's got internal stability going for it, but we're not going to say exactly how. I mean, like, if you tell me that it ought to be, like, in a self-organized way stable, I feel like I don't know very much more than you said so, before. So, 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 the, so the sand pile model is the example of a self-organized critical state where if there's an avalanche in a sand pile, it returns to, to the critical state. So, it, so it, can, it can face catastrophe and maintain in a state where it can still do what it needs to do without blowing up. I, I agree that we want systems such that if something goes wrong or they make one mistake, they do not behave like Anakin Skywalker and immediately turn completely evil, but ideally sort of like return back to um, like being nice after that, um, which is so, sort of like one of the central challenges. Uh, next question, okay, perhaps. Jürgen, managed to get a microphone in his hand already. Hi, my name is Jürgen Schmidt, from the Swiss AI lab, um, IDSIA. And um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of these arguments where the, the worry is that somebody has a really general purpose um, optimizer of utility functions, and then you have this one wrong utility function, uh, like the paper clip maximizer. But from the practice of um, AI research, what you, what you see, of course, is that there will be a totally different scenario, which is essentially uh, you will have lots of millions of different utility functions um, you will have a whole ecology of uh, competing uh, utility functions uh, driven by different utility function optimizers. And just in, like in the real ecology, in the biological ecology, you get done by AIs and smart AIs and each of them uh, trying to find its niche in a rapidly changing world of utility functions. Many of them automatically generated, like what you already did in the past millennium and so on. So um, isn't that a much more realistic thing than this paperclip uh, scenario? So that, that would get into the capability gain um, sort of like debate that is actually still ongoing that I pointed to before. Once you have the AI that is at the forefront, like is there an AI that's at the forefront, goes over a threshold, um, it, uh, one of the obvious thresholds is recursive self-improvement. Another obvious threshold is um, it exhibits a sufficiently promising result that Google dumps 100,000 times as many GPUs into it. Um, is there an AI that sort of blows past the, past the competition? Is there an AI that is the first to crack the protein folding problem, even if just by a week, and then once it, ha and if it can crack the protein folding problem and is smart enough to do rapid design after that point, build its own molecular nanotechnology. If you have that 24 hours ahead of the competition, you can shut down their ability to build their own molecular nanotechnology. It would be a pretty powerful piece of technology if it was invented. So I think that the returns on cognitive reinvestment are large. A, a point that I make in a sort of like semi-formal paper called Intelligence Explosion Microeconomics. 
I think that the history of natural selection and human brain sizes over time illustrates that since, since brains were increasing in size, we can say that as the human software was improving through natural selection, the returns on larger brains were increasing because if the marginal returns on brains were not increasing, the brain size would not have increased. It's a subtle sort of argument, but I think that we can look at the evidence in front of us and say we are not in the world where intelligence and optimization of intelligence get diminishing returns. And when you're looking at a self-improving thing, or even something that has suddenly had 100,000 times as much computing power dumped into it, that seems to me to imply large capability differentials which obviate the ecology of multiple AIs. You could have an ecology of multiple AIs, but only if the first AI to go over the critical threshold wants there to be an ecology of AIs. And if so, it is presumably decided that on the basis of having some idea of how to run them on a the equivalent of a secure operating system where they can't overwrite each other or the world. Uh, okay, one, more have, quick question. one more question. Um, okay, uh, hi there. Uh, you were just talking about economics there, and I think yesterday you asked a question and mentioned the Nash e equilibrium. I was wondering if you or anybody else you know has looked at this from the lens of a uh, game theory. So we. we um, as previously mentioned, we have various work on cooperation between agents that know each other's code. Um, the program, the, the, uh, the robust cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma paper. Um, and, as, as, and as I mentioned yesterday, our results there have tended to strongly suggest that AIs would cooperate with each other, but not with humans, because humans are sort of frozen out of the equilibrium that forms when you can prove things about each other's code, because our code is messy, and more importantly, we can't prove things about the AIs because we're not smart enough to do so. Um, but more generally, I would say that game theory is for agents that are, in a certain sense, perhaps not hostile, but indifferent to each other. If you are cooperating with the a uh, game theory presumes that the, um, that the other agent has options that make things better or worse for you in a su substantial way. Um, <clears throat> if, the, if the power difference between the other agent and, and you is great enough that they can just sort of like overwrite your choices. They are just like reprogramming all the matter within reach, whether or not it happened to make you up. You can like protest, but it doesn't cost them 100 utility points. So th I would say that cooperation based on game theory does not seem to be scalable. We do not know any way to make this work with things that are much smarter than us. Either they want you to get good outcomes, or you don't get good outcomes. The end. Great. Well, for our next talk, we have a double act. Um, Maya Kita Tegmark works in psychology at Boston University, and Max Tegmark works in physics and cosmology at MIT. They both have extremely broad interests, but I th you know, one of the subjects around which their interests converge is this uh, topic of the future of artificial intelligence. They've both been central in the Future of Life Institute, which has just been uh, founded over the last couple of years and has already become a really major force in the field. Today, they're going to talk about what we should want, physics and psychology perspectives. So please welcome May and Max. It's a pleasure and an honor for us both to be here. And uh, we were encouraged by David, those of us who, f who work in fields other than AI, to step forward and see what we can bring to the table to help with all these fascinating questions that are being discussed here. So, from that, we are going to bring perspectives from physics and? and from psychology. But of course, you know, in the good tradition of psychotherapy, I will not give you any useful answers to our very ambitious title here. I will just ask you, how do you feel about this? So back to physics. What can physics do for you? you know, we can give you tools that can help understand some of the interesting questions that we're discussing here, like what are the ultimate limits on computation, input on intelligence, the ultimate limits on the future of life, uh, the options we have for ultimate goals that we just heard about from Stuart and from Eliezer here. Um, 
for psychology, um, we can offer you tools for understanding human well-being, for debugging your minds and your thinking, and hopefully for, for designing or at least inspiring um, psychomorphic AI systems. And I use the word psychomorphic here as a parallel to neuromorphic. I mean actually constructing psychological features in artificial systems, not just projecting them onto artificial systems. Now, often when I hear my AI friends discuss what we should want, <clears throat> what sort of future we want in, on the timescale of centuries or millennia, they get scoffed on by other, uh, by other people and say, oh, that's science fiction to talk about such distant horizons like a hundred years or a thousand years. As a cosmologist, <laughs> I find this just hilarious, you know, because for us, talking about a billion years into the future isn't science fiction, it's science. It's the mainstream we do all the time. We have a very good idea of what happened in the last 13.8 billion years, and I can tell you with great confidence a lot about what's going to happen in the next billion that sort of frames this. I can tell you as a physicist, for example, that if we don't improve our technology, we're, we, the question isn't if we're going to go extinct. The question is just, are we going to get taken out first by a super volcano or an asteroid impact, or are we going to get taken out by the sun, eventually evaporating all our oceans in a billion years. So the thing, if you take a physics perspective, you really learn to love technology. And the good news is that with technology, if you, I can tell you about in the Q&A, how we can solve all of these problems and really help life flourish for billions of years if we don't wipe ourselves out first. So physics has a very optimist, optimistic message to bring to this conference, which is, first of all, yeah, technology can very much be our friend, and we also have just vastly greater potential for the future of life than we thought we had. We don't just have hundreds of years left to go, but billions, and not just here on Earth, but also throughout the cosmos. We have, over a hun we have hundreds of billions of solar systems in our galaxy, hundreds of billions of other galaxies, amazing things we can do, great resources and opportunities, and physics can also give a great deal of optimism about the future of intelligence because I know as a physicist that this brain is simply a quark blob arranged in such a way that it processes information in certain sophisticated ways and there is absolutely nothing in the laws of physics that you're saying you can't make quark blobs that are much smarter than this quark blob and if you, in case you're worried that Moore's law is about to fizzle out because you read that in a British tabloid or whatever, <laughs> physics has good news here too. The, we have actually this nice work by Seth Lloyd showing what the ultimate limits from physics are on computation, and we are 33 orders of magnitude away from that. So we can do a lot better than we can do. Yet another source of optimism is don't feel insignificant, all right? We've, during the first 13.8 billion years of life, viewed life as just a minor perturbation on an otherwise lifeless cosmos, right? But if you look at this planet, it's clear that life is having a more and more dramatic impact of what Manhattan looks like, right? Even though uh, in the cosmic scale so far, we're still just a perturbation. What physics tells us is that if intelligence keeps developing, it's, it's very likely that our entire cosmos will also transform where life goes from just being a little minor perturbation to really a dominating driving force. So a lot of uh, great opportunities here. The bad news is that physics cannot tell us which of these opportunities we should actually want. What's actually gonna make us happy and make us feel well-being in the future. So for that, we instead need to turn back to psychology. So um, us psychologists, we're much cooler. We have a very <laughs> clear answer to what you should want, unlike physicists. And what you should want, you should want happiness and you should want well-being. If, if you don't desire well-being for yourself or for your fellow human beings, see me after the talk for a diagnosis. So I was very uh, fortunate to be here um, at another, for another conference on the future of AI, organized by Jan LeCun. And one of my thinker heroes, who's right here, Daniel Kahneman, asked a very important question, namely, will AI make you happy? And I was very surprised to see uh, how difficult it was for people to engage with this question. So if we turn to psychology and try to understand a little bit about what well-being is for, human, for humans is supposed to be, 
Uh, we have different psychological theories. This is one of them. This is one of the more popular one, ones. And um, if we look at this theory, for example, human well-being has three components. Um, you should leave a, lead a pleasant life, a life of enjoyment. You should lead a good life, a life of engagement, and a meaningful life, um, feeling affiliation to your fellow human beings. You feel meaning and purpose and also accomplishment. Now, it's easy to speculate how AI can impact all of these in the future, but we can do better, actually. We can um, not just speculate, but actually test some, uh, some hypotheses that we have in psychology. So, for example, if we look at the good life, at the life of engagement, um, and take it as a case study for how AI might impact it, one worry that is um, talked about a lot is how automation might might impact the good life, the life of engagement where you, you feel you know, your own self-efficiency in the world. So what does psychology have to say about this? Um, let's see what psychology has to say about um, the possible perturbation of the job market, so job loss. Psychology says that unemployment can produce negative long-term effects on well-being. Even re-employment can produce negative effects on well-being, and that not even considering the fact that you need to switch to a different field, to a different kind of job. Even retirement has mixed effects on well-being, both positive and negative. But I, you, know, you can argue, well, does this really say anything about AI or more, more about the way we have our societies constructed? So let's look a little bit about what matters. So if we try to ask psychologists what do they what do they find about what really matters what drives this well-being we see that financial satisfaction is one of the strongest predictors of life evaluation respect being a strongest predictor of positive feeling so if we could in a way make sure that the financial needs of people are being satisfied for example by having some basic income and that they can be engaged in some um, activities that gain them the respect of other people, then maybe we can, we can actually reap the benefits of having AI that will probably make our jobs much more interesting um, and will eliminate all the drudgery and, and tasks that can be easily automated. We can go even more in depth. There are lots of other groups to study. Um, we can study part-time workers. Maybe we should just simply work less. We can uh, study homemakers. Maybe we should just focus on our relationships, raising our kids instead of work. Um, we can focus on people who retire early and so on and try to get useful insights on how, um, how, uh, how we should design a society that's very welcoming of AI and uses it for good. Um, we can also study different constructs, psychological constructs, such as self-efficiency, drudgery, play, and so on, to gain all these important information for how to make AI most beneficial for us. So we just heard about various ways in which AI can make us more happy or, or less happy, create a better future or worse future, and there's a fascinating uh, spectrum of opinions about what will actually happen if we get AI much better, particularly to the, to the human level. It's a particular honor for me to show this plot, which I partly plagiarized from waitbutwhy.com, since we have the creator of waitbutwhy.com here in, in the audience. And uh, <clears throat> this is not the only axis, though, where there's a fascinating disagreement. Pessimism versus optimism. There's also a very interesting disagreement about the timeline of things. Will we get human-level AI within a century or so, or is that very, very unlikely? Both of these, I think most of the very serious researchers and thinkers I know fall into these three categories in the upper right here. <clears throat> and I respect all three of these viewpoints. I, any of them might be right. This is a very, very legitimate topic that we should discuss more. And uh, in addition to that, we should also discuss a lot more, of, of course, all the fascinating technical challenges that come with any of those three views, such as what we heard about from Stuart Russell and Eliezer this morning, for example. So to f really be able to focus on these legitimate questions, it's very important that we don't get distracted by illegitimate questions, silly <coughs> myths and confusions, such as what Stuart Russell brought up this, this morning. Since he didn't have time to talk about all of them, let me see if I can just put them, my top seven ones or so on together on just one page here. First, there's this, this myth that we know for sure the timeline. Whereas if you actually go ask the experts, this is a poll we did at the Puerto Rico meeting last year, the conclusion is obvious. We simply don't know 
when we're going to get human level AI. There are a lot of very smart researchers who think it's never going to happen or take hundreds of years. There are also a lot of really smart ones who think maybe we'll get there in decades. So the conclusion is obvious. Um, just um, start preparing now in case this happens so we can make the best of it. Another very persistent myth is that the only people who worry about these things are Luddites. Well, I have news for you. Stuart Russell and all the other AI experts in this room who do worry about these things are not a Luddites. Another per persistent myth has to do with what it is that the worriers worry about. Uh, it's simply not the case that what Stuart Russell and others are really worried about is that AI is going to turn evil or, or turn conscious. The concern is simply not malice, but competence. If we have, uh, if I'm, for example, in charge of uh, this awesome green energy project, which is going to create a hydroelectric plant, power plant, then it's going to be great. And there's a little ant hill in the middle. You know, I actually like ants. I go out of my way on the sidewalk outside here if I see one to not step on it. But in this case, you know, tough luck for the ants. It's not that I'm an evil ant hater. It's just that my goals weren't quite aligned with the ants, and I'm going to turn on the water. And we just want to make sure we don't place humanity in the, in the position of those ants. That's what the concern is. Uh, another persistent myth is that the thing we should worry about is robots. And uh, the truth, of course, is that the concern is not robots. It's simply the intelligence. If you have some very su superior intelligence, it doesn't need a robot to have a lot of impact. It just needs an internet connection. Yet another myth is that somehow machines can't control humans. Well, the reason we can control ti tigers isn't because we have sharper claws or stronger muscles. It's just because we're smarter than them. Right? Yet another myth is that machines cannot have goals. Now, what I mean by goals? The thing we're concerned about isn't some sort of touchy-feely definition of goals. We're just concerned about exhibiting goal-oriented behavior, and that machines can absolutely do. You know, if you're chased by a heat-seeking missile, you're probably not going to say to yourself, "I'm not worried about this because that missile doesn't have goals." And just to elaborate on this a little bit more, Stuart Russell brought up this very important point of, and so did Eliezer, about emergent goals. Pretty much, whatever goal you actually have initially, which could be as, sim as silly as just maximizing your score in this little computer game I made up here where you're trying to just save the sheep and bring them in from the bad, bad wolf and get it into the air, safe area here, will give you certain other sub-goals. First of all, you realize pretty quickly it would be that you don't want to go through here and blow up because if you're a dead robot, you're not going to get any more points and save no more sheep. So you get self-preservation instinct. Pretty much whatever your goal is, again, Steve Mohandro is the first person to have brought this up. You also get a goal of uh, improving your world model, because if you when you start learning more about your world, you realize there's a shortcut here, which is great. You also tend to get an emergent goal of getting more resources, like why not get this little potion here that lets you run twice as fast? Or why not pick up this gun here so you can shoot the wolf and save all the sheep? You know? So the bottom line is, pretty much whatever goal you start with, if it's really ambitious, it will give you the sub-goal of keeping those goals, enhancing your capabilities, get better hardware, software, preserve yourself, get curious, lots of other things, okay? <clears throat> Which may, if we haven't thought this through carefully, clash with our human goals and give, give goal misalignment. Finally, we have the myth that people who worry about this <clears throat> all worry because they're persuaded that superintelligence is just, it's gonna happen next week, and that what we should all do right now is panic. When, of course, the fact is that all people <coughs> who are concerned about this are saying is, well, if there's a non-negligible ch negligible chance it might happen in this century, hey, now would be a pretty good time you know, to start planning ahead and, and preparing. Okay? Now, these are a bunch of myths that we've identified and kind of understood, but it's important to ask all, not just about them, but why? Did we make these lo lo logical mistakes? What bugs in our thinking led to these myths? Because if we can understand that, that can help us also understand other bugs in our thinking we haven't yet identified in the context of a future AI. So with that, let's turn over to our debugger, psychology. So um, psychology doesn't just offer us ways of, of testing hypotheses about our own well-being, but um, that we can you know, 
try to uh, apply both in the near-term future, for example, as I give the example of, of job markets, but also in the longer-term future when we deal with this unease of, of being outsmarted by other entities. But it can also give us some tools for, for debugging our own thinking. And Max likes to say this a lot, that in order to create a good future, we need to win the race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we manage it. So I feel that psychology has something to say about wisdom. Um, and this agrees with the uh, old Greek advice, know thyself, uh, mainly be aware of your own cognitive biases. And Daniel Kahneman has done amazing research trying to map out all these cognitive biases. If we go back to the belief, common, commonly held beliefs about AI that Max has explored, for example, this idea that it might be inevitable or impossible, here is a cognitive bias for you to consider. Maybe you are just having a confirmation bias. You are searching, interpreting, favoring, and remembering remembering information in a way that already confirms your, your own pre-existing belief. Um, another commonly held belief, uh, especially in the general public, is that robots are the main concern. Maybe people should worry a little bit about the availability bias, and namely that you're overestimated the overestimating the likelihood of events happening, maybe because of all those Hollywood blockbusters that you've seen, or simply because of the cognitive strain that you know, it takes to, under, to really imagine a disembodied intelligence. So uh, coming back here to the question of what we should want and ultimate goals and so on, yet another thing that physics brings to the table is a little word of caution, that more work is needed here. We heard particularly El Eliezer talk here about how th things get harder when you start thinking really long-term about open-ended goals, because most AI problems are not like that. Traditionally, it's like, okay, goal, win this chess game. Goal, drive this self-driving car from A to B safely. Okay, we know how to handle that. But a lot of famous papers, and even Nick Bostrom's book, talks about the idea of final goals. Something much more long-term, the ultimate goal of the machine, of the, of the, that a super-intelligent AI might have. And here, as a physicist, big warning flags go off. You know, what do we mean by the final goal for our universe? Do we mean that we have a function that specifies exactly the best way to arrange all our particles? That's the goal? Okay, suppose the, we managed to accomplish that. Now what? You know, time doesn't end. At least not last time I was doing physics research, there's no indication of that. So, so there's, things are going to keep happening. The whole question of final goals really deserves a lot more research to make sure we're not just chasing after a mirage here. And um, moreover, we know a few things about the ultimate fate of our cosmos, we think. Entropy keeps increasing, and it seems like ultimately whatever we do, there'll be some kind of cosmic heat death, which will be kind of a bummer. So I think the real key message here from physics is really, it's not the destination, it's the journey. So um, going back to the journey and to see what psychology has to say about this journey and how to make it happy, um, we've heard yesterday a very beautifully articulated vision for the future of human and, I, uh, and AI collaboration um, that was expressed by Francesca Rossi. So I think that you know, if we envision and if we work towards a future uh, where AI systems will be our um, companions, our collaborators, maybe, me, maybe even our descendants, then something that we will probably want is to put in them cognitions and behaviors that we are most proud of. And the good news from psychology um, is that so, for example, one, one very good, one very good um, cognitive and behavioral mechanism is, is altruism, right? We might want to have that in our companion robots, in our collaborator AI systems. Um, so the good news from psychology is that altruists exist, uh, and even extreme altruists exist, and not just as an idea in our heads, but actually in actual real people. Um, and this is an existence proof that there is, th it is possible to have intelligent entities that are even more altruistic than most people. And we'll hear from the next speaker how, you know, super intelligent might be even construed as super ethical. And the even better news is that uh, psychology is now making a lot of progress trying to understand really the cognitive mechanisms behind extreme altruism. And I won't go into details now in the interest of time, but I, I'd be happy to get questions about this, this amazing paper that came out two years ago. So um, 
to wrap this things up, I hope that Max and I have convinced you that there are some very useful tools, both from physics and from psychology, in terms of considering what we want. And um, I hope we all use them when we meet with the proverbial genie so that you know, we ask for the right things and don't have to put them back in the bottle. So thank you very much. Hi. Uh, my question is, how can we prevent religion mingling too much into AI? So in the future, we don't have AI who probably hates people who masturbate or uh, hates uh, people who are homosexual, for example. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a very interesting question, which I think is part of the broader question about when we say we want to make sure that the, the future AI is aligned with our values, Whose values? Are we talking about my values, ISIS's values, some do random dude uh, in the Middle Ages as values? You know. So I think the the real message here is first of all, of course, this, this is a very important open question, and second, this shows that to really make the best of AI, it's not enough to just have technical research among AI scientists, right? We all we really need to get psychologists, sociologists, philosophers. And also, to, uh, and really, the whole human community looking into these questions because this is an answer that everybody has to come together and really pursue. Um, so, just a, a, a quick thought from the point of view of psychology. So, if we look at psychopathology, for example, and and when we define psychopathology, we really define it. Um, it boils down not to values. It actually boils down to how well you are able to cooperate in, in, in a human society. Um, so I think that one thing that we might want to make sure that the AI systems that we create have is, is this ability to really cooperate well with us. Now, you know, human beings have not been so good at about cooperating with other species, so actually we don't know what, what is going to happen, but that's one goal and one vision that we, we should have. I think. And just very briefly, one other very interesting point which Francesca Rossi mentioned yesterday is that in the short term, even be long before we've figured out what we ultimately want, it makes a lot of sense to put in at least some kindergarten ethics that we can all agree on into the systems we build. Like airplanes should never under any circumstances, if they have any kind of AI in them, fly into a building or fly into a mountain, like when Andreas Lubitz, the German wings pilot, told us to do that, right? <clears throat> Already putting in some basic uh, minimal ethics into machines is going to be a big step up from wh where we are now. We shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So for Ms. Kita Tegmark, um, insofar as some undesirable behaviors might actually be beneficial towards goals, for example, in rationality, sometimes people talk about how maybe you're procrastinating because the thing that you're going to do shouldn't actually be done. Um, maybe you should be focusing on something else, and that's why you end up procrastinating, because you shouldn't be doing the thing. Um, or, in, or just vaguely, if some undesirable behaviors are equilibria in really subtle ways, do you think that, um, in terms of like embedding psychological mechanisms in AI, do you think that it could be problematic to only embed beneficial, obviously beneficial behaviors and psychological mechanisms? So, so that is a very good question. Um, personally, I feel a little bit more pessimistic, um, honestly, about our ability to really create psychomorphic um, AI systems. And the reason for that is that I feel, you know, evolution has had a very, very long time to try all sorts of solutions. And I feel that, you know, in the spirit of what Stephen Wolfram was talking about yesterday, we might actually stumble upon solutions for behaviors, you know, that don't go through the same routes of, of our own cognitions and, and feelings. So I think, you know, it's... a it, they will be inspired by our psychology, and in that in that in that way, you know, they will they will have both some of our uh, that we we would want for them to have some of our beneficial, you know, um, behaviors. But in terms of you know the cognitions and the justifications of those behaviors in the grander you know scheme of of the of the AI psyche, so to talk, um, it's it's hard to imagine what that architecture would be like. I mean, we we don't know yet so much about our own psychology. 
that uh, I think there are huge technical issues even in just specifying how is it that we behave in the way that we behave or have the cognitions that we, we have. But it's, a, it's an interesting question. Like, are we able to create, will we be able to create sort of the ideal, um, you know, behavioral and cognitive entity or not? Um. Thanks. Uh, in one of the slides, you had a, a rocket, uh, and you said that that rocket has a goal, um, which, I, I mean, it all boils down to definitions, but what kind of, what was the def what would be like a definition of the goal of the rocket? And the real question is, what's the difference between the rocket's goal and a human goal versus an AI goal? I, like, I, have, I guess I have to bring mm -hmm. the word consciousness up, like a yes. conscious goal versus just a physical, material, you know, find the lowest energy state sort of goal. Uh, so, uh, and wh how do you think that comes about, like this conscious goal versus these just Great. atomic goals? Excellent questions. So let me answer that. When, if we, ca if we care about how the machines feel and if we're being cruel to them and uh, whether there's mind crime like Nick Bostrom said and so on, then we care a lot about consciousness and, and all the subjective issues. But if we, c for, for, if we care about us, what's going to happen to us, it simply doesn't matter at all whether the machine has a subjective experience in the spirit of David Chalmers' hard problem, it just matters what it does. Okay, so if we look at the behavior of machines, then we can make a very clear definition of what we mean by it having goals. We can ask, is the behavior of the machine best explained caused through causality, that this caused this, caused this, or is it more economically explained teleologically? So saying this heat-seeking missile is simply acting as if it's trying to hit my airplane. And we have a lot of examples where machines are most economically described like the latter. And whenever that happens, I think it's reasonable to say they're showing goal-oriented behavior. That's what I mean by having goals. And uh, if a machine has as its goal, in that sense, you know, to do something that we don't want it to do, that's a problem. So I think the message is very clear in the sense that matters, that, we, that could cause us to have concern, yes, machines can have goals. So I, think, I think what Max is trying to do is he's trying to encourage you to be a, a hardcore behaviorist, basically, when you think about AI. <laughs> but, I, 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 and you and David Chalmers can t testify to this, I think the question of consciousness is absolutely fascinating, and I'm spending a lot of my research, actually, in MIT studying it. But that does not change the fact that completely aside from that, machines can exhibit goal-oriented behavior, and we want to make sure it's that behavior is what we want. Okay, many thanks. Okay, we're we're basically going to power on through. There's not a uh, there's not a coffee break, but while Wendell sets up, feel free to take a you know take a minute or so to stretch in place. Um, as a little mini break, we figure if people start leaving this place, we'll never get them back in. So. Stick around, we're starting in one minute. Okay. Um, are you... Uh, I'm all set, but we need the... Uh, oh. the dongle. Has the dongle disappeared on us? There was a dongle. Ah, oh, there it is. Good. Okay, good. I'm ready whenever you want. Do you, you, you want to give people a minute or two because they're going to wander? I said for a minute. We'll give them two minutes. Yeah, they're going to wander. We shouldn't give them that. No, we start giving Craig more than that. They probably will start to... Uh, and they already are. <laughs> Okay, 30 second warning.
Okay, we're starting up again. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Singularity. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, so now we're, is this working? It's not really working. What does in fact work? Is this, this is working okay? Okay, so now we're getting to um, the fourth and fifth talks in, our, in this session are both gonna be by philosophers reflecting on these issues. Wendell Wallach has been a really a pioneer in thinking about ethical issues about artificial intelligence um, he's written a couple of classic books in the area. Um, Moral Machines is, a, is really, I think, become the classic book on machine ethics, the project of trying to program or build ethical principles and ethical behaviors into machines. Um, more recently, he's also written a book called The Dangerous Master on the way in which tech, we can keep te technology beneficial and under our control. He's based at the... Uh, Yale University and Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics, where he's been centrally involved with many projects in the foundations of technology and especially artificial intelligence. He's heading up a number of programs in that area now, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about moral machines from machine ethics to value alignment. So please welcome Wendell Wallach. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Am I close enough? Great. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, as those of you who know my work know um, I focus primarily on near term rather than the longer term uh, ethical and governance challenges posed by emerging technologies. As far as the longer term concerns such as superintelligence, I'm your friendly skeptic. I'm friendly to the can-do engineering spirit that says remarkable things are coming in, in the future. I'm skeptical as to whether we know enough about intelligence to know whether it's reproducible by computational means. And while my skepticism hasn't totally disappeared, I am truly heartened and appreciate the work being done by people like Stewart and Eliezer focusing on the control problem, reorienting the trajectory of artificial intelligence so that we can be working on both the long-term concerns, but through approaches that are actually going to help us deal with the near-term ethical considerations also. But I do sometimes become concerned that we are overlooking the socio-technological challenges that are arising. These are not just autonomous systems that we're building, but they're part of the whole human project. They're part of our socio-technological world. Uh, I sometimes think we overlook the extent to which what we're creating may really differ from anything we have seen beforehand. So perhaps the machine-human comparisons aren't as good as we'd like them to be. Um, in fact, we may be engaging in our own form of self-deception, and it might be helpful if we came up with a totally new ontological category for what we're creating here. Most of what, we'll, what we see tends to be joint cognitive systems rather than purely autonomous systems. And one of the major concerns that comes up when you're talking about joint cognitive systems is this problem of coordination and coordination failures. And coordination failures can lead to disasters. And disasters have a lot to do with helping shape the trajectory of how technologies uh, uh, get, get, uh, get developed. For example, we have no idea what the public acceptance or how the public is going to react when we have the first self-driving car that kills a pedestrian. Think of this, for example. We're really engaged in an experiment with self-driving cars. And pedestrians are human subjects in these experiments, but they aren't giving any kind of a con informed consent. And there may be a strong reaction, there may be a mild reaction. It's not clear at the moment. But there are other things that are going to affect the way in which this technology develops. If we don't get a ban on lethal autonomous weapons, then all bets are off as far as our ability to develop AI in a truly beneficial, robust, safe, and controllable manner. And then there's technological unemployment. That was John Maynard Keynes's term for the 200-year-old Luddite concern that each new technology will rob more jobs than it creates. 
Hasn't happened for 200 years. Each new technology creates more jobs, but perhaps we're starting to witness for the first time the downward pressure that automation is placing on jobs and wage growth. This is not an AI problem per se, but if our socio-political systems don't address this, then we may get reactions against the technology which won't stop development but could radically slow development or what will be acceptable and what won't be acceptable. But I want to focus upon the prospects for implementing moral decision-making faculties in computers and robots. That was a, a dream that first appeared to, uh, to science fiction writers, most notably Isaac Asimov, who with his stories on, on the laws for robots, the first one of which was Roundabout in 1942, he changed the whole trajectory of robot fiction. Up to that time, we had only robots that turned bad. Suddenly, we had robots that could be good. Over, over the first decade of this 21st century, this idea, not the laws of robots per se, but the question of whether we could implement moral decision-making faculties in computers and robots, it captured an array of different scholars, philosophers, legal theorists, there were a few computer scientists in there, game theorists, psychologists, and they slowly gave birth to a new field of research, now, when Colin and Alan and I set out to first map and lay foundations for that new field of inquiry, which, it, um, which we covered in our book, Moral Machine Teaching Robots Right from Wrong, it had many different names. From the more philosophical side, it was called machine morality, machine ethics, computational ethics, artificial morality. And then we had Eliezer and his colleagues who were uh, tackling it more directly from specifically whether we could control superintelligence, which was a, which was a different orient somewhat different orientation at that time. But the field didn't settle on one term per se. But I think the basic idea is that if we can design AI systems that are sensitive to moral considerations and factor those considerations into their choices and actions, new markets for their adoption will be opened up. On the other hand, if we fail to adequately accommodate human laws and values, there's going to be demands for regulations that limit their use. Initially, this field of research was one part moral philosophy, one part applied ethics, one part moral psychology, and another part, I would say, computer science, mathematics, um, more hard sciences would get involved. In other words, the hard sciences played a very small role in the research that was actually going on. But if you approach this from the perspective of a moral philosopher and uh, a and it's been interesting that in our talk so far, words like morality and ethics have not appeared very often. In fact, the, I only counted it twice from, from, uh, from Max, and he used the term um, grammar school morality. Was that, was that the phrase that we had? I didn't, I didn't hear those words from either Stuart or, or Eliezer. But uh, when you approach it from the perspective of a moral philosopher, the question is, well, what role should ethical theory, should moral ph philosophy play in the design architecture and the control architecture of, of a computational system? And you might turn to two broad approaches. One is the top-down approach. And top-down approach, there is a philosophical definition at the top for those of you who like that kind of thing. But top-down really refers to capturing any moral theory or principle within the system. So we're talking about the Ten Commandments, we're talking about Kant's categorical imperative, utilitarianism, and Isaac Asimov's Laws for Robots, which started out as three but eventually became four. So it's really, could one of the languages of ethics be instantiated computationally? Bottom-up approaches refer much more to what happens in the moral development, the moral education of a child. Could you take it through a process where it learned about morality, regardless of whether it, it was directed toward any higher order ethical theory? And it takes inspiration from learning, from evolutionary psychology. Um, we have uh, game theory comes into play there, uh, genetic algorithms, all kinds of different techniques, learning algorithms might be appropriated for a learning computer. 
But there was a third area that came up when we looked at this, and, and, and much of the research that's gone on has looked at different approaches and whether they really are computationally tractable or not. Or not. But there's a third distinction that really has to be made here, and that's that humans are evolved systems. We evolved from a biochemical platform, and our higher order faculties, they emerged from the instinctual emotional brain. Computers are logical platforms from the get-go. Now, this might give computers certain advantages. They're natural born stoics. They can do broad ranges of calculation. We humans, our, our rationality is bounded. Furthermore, these computers have an absence of emotional biases, they have an absence of base motivations, and they, have, and they are not likely to have emotional hijackings. On the other hand, I grew up in the age when stoicism was what was valued in moral decision making. We now live in the age of moral intelligence where we really reflect on both the beneficial and dysfunctional aspects of, of emotions. And that raises the question of whether artificial moral agents are going to require some form of affective intelligence. Well, they need emotions of their own, and will it be a satisfactory if they just have cognitive emotions, weights that are programmed into them, or will they have, have somatic emotions? Will they have to be able to feel? And what if they have just simple faculties, such as the ability to read the emotional expressions on human beings? Are we going to feel comfortable with that? I don't mind if a robot knows that I'm smiling, but I don't know what the goals of the robot may be, and I may be very uncomfortable if it knows when I'm vulnerable. But I think one of the most important areas in all of this, and perhaps where we made a significant contribution, which may not be as apparent today as it was back in 2008 when our book was published, is that there are many capabilities beyond moral reasoning that go into moral decision making. And that was a period when there was getting to be a lot of fresh research just beginning in different areas of, of human moral psychology. And people were beginning to focus on emotions, sociability, embodiment, theory of mind, empathy, consciousness, understanding, what these different capabilities play in our, in our decision making, capabilities other than emotion which were often overlooked in the history of, of moral philosophy. And that created a whole subfield of looking at specific capabilities, when they would be needed for moral decision making, and what role they played. Certainly they played roles of access to new forms of information that might not be there otherwise. But what role does consciousness, what functional role does consciousness play in moral decision making? And there is a paper that we produced on that particular question. But when you look at this whole challenge more broadly, there are two really hard problems here. One is whatever goal, norm, rules, principles, or procedures you select, how do you implement them? The other is what I refer to as framing problems. And framing problems is how does the system recognize it's in an ethically significant situation? How does it discern essential from inessential information? How does it estimate the sufficiency of the information it has? And I won't go through all of these, but these are you know, different kinds of things that are framing problems that are very difficult to bring in. So that gives you a, a very quick synopsis of what went on in the first decade. And I heard about values alignment for the first time in a speech that Stuart gave two years ago. And I immediately recognized it as a bottom-up approach to machine ethics. But it was clear that the engineers and the ethicists didn't necessarily know <laughs> that background or that thinking at all. And what was exciting for me is that this was starting to be picked up more as an engineering, as a computer science, as an AI challenge, and wasn't just the reflections of, of us philosophers and cognitive scientists and so forth um, looking at, at what the challenges might be. But it was interesting that the emphasis was on the word values here. And I came to understand that engineers were very uncomfortable with words like ethics. And I think that was actually illustrated in some of our earlier, earlier talks. They perhaps see morality as nothing more than politics by other means. Or perhaps they're very cognizant of the failure of ethics or the constant ethical debates about which ethical theory, consequentialism or deontology or virtue theory should be superior and which form of those should be superior. The problem is that ethical theories didn't, have not led to clear action procedures, either for humans or for, 
or for computational systems. There's no moral algorithms. And I, but I also think that what's going on here is something similar to what happened at the beginning of the Enlightenment. At the beginning of the Enlightenment, we all acquired a self for the first time. Up to that time, individuals had souls. They didn't have selves. And the word self slowly came into being to substitute for the word soul as the individual because it didn't carry the theological baggage that the word soul did. So perhaps we're trying to expunge ourselves of some of the the, the dross that maybe ethics brings with it. But I'm concerned about whether we are bringing in new biases and that they'll have their own, their own losses. So I'm particularly concerned about what might be lost as we take on a broader and broader technocratic explanations for human faculties. I, for example, have meditated for 47 years now. I've got tens of thousands of hours in, in doing that. Now, perhaps I'm just stupid and I've wasted a significant portion of my life. I don't think so. I think what that is all about is about subtle sensibilities that science doesn't really know how to approach yet. Here's a quote I sort of like from Stephen Hawking. He said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. Now, when engineers approach the challenge of implementing moral decision-making faculties, they usually think of ethics in terms of a utility function. I think we saw that um, quite effectively with Eliezer's conversation. Or they look at it in terms of constraints on behavior. And this is all, this is all very helpful and good, but I think we need to be aware what the problematics are there. For example, and this goes back into all kinds of reflections around utilitarianism, consequentialism, what is being maximized? What does that utility function really stand for? What are you trying to maximize? Is it pleasure, as was brought up in our last talk? Is it the good? And what is the good? Is it human welfare? And how do we define human welfare? Now, the previous century was beset by political systems for whom the greatest good for the greatest number was an aphorism that they lived by. And they had no compunction about killing tens and even hundreds of thousands of people in, the, in pursuit of maximizing the greatest good for the greatest number. This has always been a weakness of utilitarian approaches to, to ethics. And it is perhaps not an, an accident that John Stuart Mill really one of the two founding fathers, along with Jeremy Bentham, of what we know as utilitarian theory, also wrote a book called On Liberty, which in some senses compensates for, I think, the weaknesses within utilitarianism by itself. So the importance is that utilitarianism, if left just to itself, can run roughshod over human rights. And human rights are essentially deontological. But nevertheless, utilitarianism is very attractive from a scientific perspective because it says just calculate. Look at the various consequences of your action and add up the benefits and, and um, losses that you get and then select the one that gives you the most, the most benefits. The problem is our information tends to be inadequate, tends to be inaccurate, and consequences can't fully be determined. So very few people actually go through some form of utilitarian process, utilitarian analysis, though there are strong advocates for that, and I even advocate for that in, various con in certain contexts. So uh, here's two of our main advocates. Um, we have Peter Singer and we have uh, uh, Josh Green. Now let me take you back to something that came up yesterday a little bit to talk about another problematic with utilitarian determinations of the appropriate action. And that's the application of trolley car problems to the driverless cars. So I think we all know what that's about. That's largely about should the car kill a number of, of pedestrians or individuals in some form or another, should drive off the bridge and kill the passengers of the car. And uh, in Science Magazine, there were two articles about this in June. One of those articles um, was a piece of, of uh, public opinion research that found that the preponderance of people wanted a utilitarian calculation. They said, kill the, kill the least number of people. But they were asked another 
question. And surprise, surprise, most of them said, I would not buy a car <laughs> that would kill me and my family. Now, there was a companion piece to that by Josh Green. And Josh Green said, well, let's build moral algorithms into these cars. Now, he could be excused for such naivete because he'd read Moral Machines. In fact, he'd read it <laughs> twice. <laughs> And even though I have advocated for the implementation of moral decision-making faculties in computers and robots, this is not a morally decidable challenge. There is no right answer. Are we going to, for example, implement moral algorithms into cars that might kill the occupants, but it stops millions of people from buying those cars, which means to stop one once in a trillion accident and save a couple lives, we may lose thousands of people who die because, they, because of human error. In other words, we've got a long-term utilitarian calculation and a short-term utilitarian calculation. It's not decided by moral theory. It's the, the need for the establishment of a new norm. And we probably need multi-stakeholder uh, committees to engage in that process. Now, there's also been a lot of discussion that's gone on over the last few hundred years about whether uh, you can turn utilita utility into rules and duties or rules and duties into utility. In other words, can most of our rules and utility, or at least the ones we want to carry into the future, can they be described in utilitarian terms? And from the deontological side, um, it's often been said, well, the greatest good for the greatest number is one of the prima facie duties that we have, but it is not the determinant of all actions. It just plays off against other prima facie duties that we have. From the side of utilitarianism, there's been concern about how we can contract this whole process because utility analysis can be really time consuming, can take a lot of energy, and can we contract it down to simple heuristics. So can we have rule utilitarianism, which is in a sense a compromise where you turn your utility analysis into a bunch of, of rules, heuristics, that you can make quick decisions. But all of us understand there are some limitations of where making quick decisions are good and where they override other concerns. And as we have become aware, there are cognitive biases. There are all kinds of cognitive biases that we humans indulge. And we are subservient to bad reasoning in, um, in areas that Dan Kahneman has, uh, has helped elucidate for us all. And I guess all I want to say is sort of bringing up my concluding section is that we need to start thinking about what are the cognitive biases of engineers and the ways they're going to approach this challenge. And I am not bringing this, these critiques up as a naysayer. I am totally supportive of any approach to implement moral decision-making faculties in our computers and robots to see how far we can get. But the biases are that ethics is merely a constraint problem, and it's not merely a constraint problem. Or the utilitarianism or consequentialism is the way we should go in all matters. No, it's the correct way of going in some matters, but there are areas of concern, such as medical ethics, where it becomes problematic. And that the stoicism is a good thing that robots have. I think a lot of people understand, no, the stoicism may not be adequate for some of the kinds of moral intelligence we like. And there's a tendency to confuse right and wrong with human moral psychology. In other words, the way we make this moral decisions isn't, also has flaws within it, also has cognitive biases within it. And there'll be a tendency to ride roughshod over the is-ought distinction, as Eliezer did when he brought up David Hume in, in, in his talk, or the naturalistic fallacy. I'm not going to get into those at all, because that's way beyond the scope of, of this particular talk. But all I'm trying to say is, let's keep the biases in mind. We are still engaged in an experiment here. We're engaged in an inquiry as to how far we can get in creating intelligent systems through computational means. We have no idea. We have all kinds of theories and all kinds of conclusions about where this is going. No, this is still an experiment, and a lot of these theories may turn out to be wrong. And if, 
If there happen to be clear limits in our ability to develop artificial moral agents or manage robots, then it's incumbent upon us to recognize those limits so that we can turn our attention away from a false reliance on autonomous systems and toward more human intervention in the decision-making processes of computers and robots. Thank you very much. Hi, Henry Kong here. Um, yeah, Stuart was talking about how uh, one approach to making machines ethical is to program them to be uh, sort of more like us or, or, or learn from how, how people are or how mm -hmm. people are. Um, but, uh, you know, I see a conflict here, uh, and you're saying another approach is to sort of um, teach them not how we are, but how we want to be uh, in terms of things like um, consequentialism, uh, deontology. But then, you know, I. Who's the ontology and who's consequentialism? I, I look around the room and I see a certain demographic, for example, you know, yeah. white, male, affluent, um, Western. And uh, if these are the people who are going to be creating these machines, then that creates biases of its own. And so, you know, you have people who, um, well, Jonathan Haidt calls them weird ethics. So if, are we going to program weird ethics into, into, the, uh, into, the, into the systems? So there's a conflict between do, the, do we want the machines to be more like us or more like the people we want to be, but then who are the people we want to be? So I don't think the problem here is that we know what the machine should be, but there is probably going to, we're probably going to create standards for them, and if they don't at least live up to good human values, we, uh, we're going to be very uncomfortable with them. I mean, it would be great if they could do what your children do. They bring you an ethical dilemma that, um, that you have no answer for. But you're just thrilled <laughs> that they recognize that that ethical dilemma even just exists. Put there, Wendell. Oh, excuse me? Just lift your feet for a second. Okay, okay good. Um, but there's, there's a lot more to this, and uh, there's other approaches to, to this problem. Uh, there's a, the third big tent in ethical theory is virtue theory. And virtue theory says it's not the consequences of your action or follow the the good, which is a determinant of what's right, true, and just. But it says it's the actions of what virtuous people do, and it's about the cultivation of that kind of character, which, which would be great if we do within machines. We can start to think about it now that we have some more effective learning algorithms than we used to have. But that's kind of an interesting approach because these bottom-up approaches tend to be much more flexible, much more adaptive than the top-down, which you know, are very hard to fit in all actions within one category or not. So we're going to want this kind of adaptive learning that, that Stuart outlined, but we may also need to subject it to some kind of top-down evaluation as to what it's, whether it's appropriate or not. He alluded to the problems of whose behavior are they observing? Who are they learning from? Are we going to be able to keep them isolated from, from the bad actors? Could you imagine a robot that was just sitting there watching American news <laughs> for the last six months trying to learn what appropriate values were to be an American citizen? Okay. Next, I uh, see one at the, uh, at the back there. Just next to you. Hi, my name is Chris Hatter, uh, Columbia University alumnus. So my question is, in the present philosophy engineering dialectic, that does exist in part in this room and in other spaces, what do you see as the big problems in addition to the ones you've already enumerated, which are the, the human biases? Well, the biggest problem is we all live in our silos, you know, and we have very little appreciation for the perspectives of other scholars. And, and my work right now, partially in thanks to uh, a grant that came from the Future of Life Institute, and the steward and I have been running some workshops around, has been focused more on silo busting, bringing different kinds of thinkers together and brainstorming over these ideas and getting insights from each other. Um, it's not just that we live in silos, but our institutions don't reward people for transdisciplinary thinking. They all say we need more interdisciplinarians, but very few people get rewarded within the present structure of academia for, 
for interdisciplinary work, and it often happens only within, for, from older established scholars. It would be nice if the young scholars who want to jump into these more transdisciplinary challenges we would get rewarded for that, that we'd have more of these institutes that really want to draw upon a transdisciplinary perspective. Okay, one more quick question. Um, Rob, over there. Hi, uh, thanks for that. This is uh, mostly just a request for clarification. Mm -hmm. At one point, you distinguished between, I think you said, uh, merely cognitive emotions versus real affect. You were wondering wh which of those you might need for moral decision making. Can you just say a little bit more about uh, what you mean by uh, each of those notions? Sure. Well, all of the super rational faculties or faculties beyond reasoning that I had on that slide, there are attempts to simulate them, at least in in cognitive in uh, computer science in one form or another. So we have affective computing, we have machine consciousness, we have all these fields going on. But when people talk about affective computing, they're often talking about putting weights on the relationship between different percepts. So if it comes to killing somebody, maybe you could put a heavy weight that says no. <laughs> you know? So it's really a mathematical, ultimately it's a mathematical weight on a judgment that represents an emotion. And that's what I mean by cognitive emotions versus somatic emotions, which are what we feel. Now, there is a view of life that not only consciousness, but all of what we are is this vast infrastructure of somatic emotions, of somatic markers, and that a lot of what our moral education is about is strengthening and weakening those markers. And furthermore, that our emotions are very much about maintaining us as integrated beings, as integrated entities. And that that is a fundamental grounding for our ethics. That's way beyond the scope of anything that we're talking about in AI at this point. And, and, it, and that is perhaps beyond what most of us want these machines to understand in terms of practical ethics and not doing harm in some of the obvious contexts that they will move through. But it may be something fundamentally that colors what it means to be an ethic, ethical agent, what it means to be an ethical being, why we evolved as ethical beings because we needed throughout evolution to maintain that integrity. And unfortunately, too often, we fall, fall to what I will call the, uh, the ethics heuristic, which is ethics is what is my opinion. And my opinion should be treated as a categorical imperative. <laughs> and if nothing else, I'm just trying to say to here, there's perhaps a little bit more going on in ethics and whether or not it's going to yield us algorithms, simple action procedures. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, the last talk in this session is by another philosopher. Steve Peterson is at uh, Niagara University in New York. Steve's background is in, uh, is in epistemology. He's worked in a whole lot of, er of, of fields over the years. He's done some really interesting work on algorithmic metaphysics and algorithmic information theory as, the, as the, uh, the basis for a certain kind of metaphysics of the world. And in recent years, he's been increasingly turning to issues in the ethics of artificial intelligence with a number of um, important publications and things like the volume on robot ethics. But uh, his uh, talk for today is going to be very much, I think, engaging some of these issues about values and their connection to intelligence and, and goals. And uh, the title is Superintelligence as Superethical. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so, so far you've heard from the guy who literally wrote the book on AI, Stuart Russell. Then you heard from Eliezer, whose institute seems to produce amazing results every couple weeks or so. And, uh, I mean, and also, the, I can attest, the Harry Potter fan fiction is pretty good. I'm about two-thirds of the way through. And it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And then we heard from the uh, team from the Future of Life Institute, who, uh, one of whom is a physicist who may have written the book of the universe, perhaps. 
And then finally, as, as Dave put it, uh, Wendell Wallach, uh, the one who wrote the, the classic book on ethics of AI. And now finally the moment has arrived, the moment you've been waiting for. Uh, uh, you get to hear from the guy from the little liberal arts college outside Buffalo. <laughs> my, my wife says I'm a terrible self-promoter, and it's totally true. And, uh, uh, Another way, I'm, uh, another self-deprecating thing I'll say is uh, Peter Railton said yesterday, uh, the slides of moral philosophers tend to look uninteresting, and uh, I guess today I'm a true moral philosopher. Uh, my background's epistemology, but yeah, these slides won't have pictures, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and my talk is also like Peter's in that I too am going to be pushing against what's been called the orthogonality thesis, so uh, let's take a look. First, we're going to talk about the goals. What is it for a superintelligence to have goals? This has come up some already. Um, here's the problem in a nutshell, in case somehow you're just tuning into this or something just to see me. Um, the, 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 I, so this paper is a response in some ways to moderate some of the worries in Nick Bostrom's book. But as I hope it makes, I'm, I'll make clear, it's a very serious worry, and I'm glad there are people like Stuart and Eliezer and others working on it. But the problem is that, well, it seems like once we get genuine AI, assuming it's possible, it seems likely to bootstrap itself probably pretty quickly into a superintelligence, pr pretty probably one that'll have a strategic decisive advantage, so it doesn't need to cooperate with others and so on. And this is one way where I think my proposal is a little different from, from Peter's, maybe, uh, tries to accommodate that possibility. Um, such superintelligence could wipe us out through mere indifference, as we've heard. Uh, they could have the bottom level goal of maximizing paper clips, just of different value from ours, not malice, but uh, as the comparison is gone, to with like ants. Uh, it's, we don't, as, as Max said and Stuart has said, we don't think twice about, uh, well, maybe twice, maybe once and a half about destroying an anthill, but we don't let it, them get in our way, and we might be like that to the superintelligence. Um, so it could, it seems, have very different values from ours, like maximizing paper clips. As Eliezer was pointing out, it's easy to anthropomorphize here. It's easy to say nothing smart could care at bottom about paper clips. But it's easy to forget that you know we have our values from this weird evolutionary history. We like sugar. We like sex. We like these things because of how we've evolved, right? But these machine intelligences won't have any of that background shaping their values. They could have really alien, different values to ours. Um, so the key move in, in, this, in this worry, as, as Eliezer pointed out and is featured in, 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 in Nick's book, is the, this orthogonality thesis, that intelligence and final goals are orthogonal. More or less any level of intelligence could in principle be combined with more or less any final goal. Uh, there's two key terms there we need to talk about. One is this word intelligence. Now, there's a kind of a consensus in the AI community and in the philosophy of AI community, from what I can tell, that intelligence just means basically means and reasoning, being really good at achieving your goal in the face of obstacles. The more obstacles you can overcome, the more kinds of obstacles, the more things you think of ahead of time, including other people trying to put obstacles in your way and so on, the more intelligent you are in this sort of thin sense of intelligence. The other technical, semi-technical term here is final goal, which came up a bit earlier. Final goal, uh, philosophers contrast with instrumental goals. So we, many of us in this room probably have the goal of making money, but we don't want to make money just for its own sake. We only want money because that helps us get something else that we want. And why do we want that? Well, maybe we w because we get a vacation. Why do we want the vacation? For the relaxation. Why do we want that? Uh, pleasure. Why do we want pleasure? The regress ends, right? That's the so-called final goal. I just, that's, I just value that. That's what we mean by final goals. Um, now, of course, many philosophers, optimists that we are about reason in some way or another, we want to suggest that reason can incline us towards final goals. Um, now, there's lots of reasons to doubt this. I'm not positive about it myself, for sure, but today I'm going to tentatively defend this idea. I mean, maybe it's just philosophers, you know, we have this hammer of, uh, of reasoning and we like to think, and that makes every problem look like a nail, right, including ethics, perhaps. Maybe we're overgenerating what it can do. But I want to defend it here, and I want to defend it using some principles that I think Bostrom would agree to. Um, first, we have to talk about complex final goals. Intended goal content, as Eliezer was saying, is often too complex to specify explicitly when you try to spell it out in, in machine language, right? So um, Bostrom agrees, he worries about, and, and as Eliezer did, perverse instantiations of program goals. So there's this old debate, unfortunately Eliezer skipped over it, but the smiley face goal, right? Where like, oh, we want more smiles. Well, okay, that's easy, just uh, tile the universe with tiny pictures of smiles. Oh no, sorry, I meant human smiles. Oh, that's easy, we'll just paralyze your facial musculature. Uh, uh, okay. 
Uh, one way this is really well illustrated, this is another, I keep referencing Eliezer, but uh, 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 he has this interesting example of like uh, a website where they try to specify how to give a genie a wish without the genie. The genie, of course, seeks perverse instantiations, right? The genie wants to find ways to hit the letter but not the spirit of what you're asking for. And it turns out really hard to do. Um, so there are these complex goals. Well, um, even a, an apparently simple goal like maximizing paper clips is actually pretty complicated because what is a paper clip? That sounds like something only a philosopher could worry about unless you're trying to maximize them. <laughs> if you're trying to maximize them, it matters, right? If they're, suppose you want, you, might make them, you want to make them really small, nano-sized or something, but does it count as a paper clip then if it could never conceivably actually clip paper together? Well, this is something the paperclip maximizer would have to work out. And more to our point, uh, maybe the paperclips would look just like the ones we have in our office today, but uh, the, the, the super intelligence creating them knows that they will never be used for clipping paper together because all humans and all paper are busy being made into more paperclips. So maybe that wouldn't count as a paperclip. You have to settle these issues. The super intelligence would have to settle these issues, or something would. Um, so Bostrom's solution to this kind of problem in the positive part of his book where he, he wants to talk about loading human-friendly goals into an AI is the AI has to learn the goal. The AI has to learn the goal. And that's, I lean on that pretty heavily. So we got to talk about that, learning final goals. Well, it, when you think about it, it seems odd to talk about learning a final goal. You, to learn something, it seems like you need feedback toward, toward or away from some background standard. Well then, that background standard was really your final goal, right? The, the, how could you learn your final goal? This is a kind of Humean dilemma. It seems like you can't reason about these, these goals. Um, but at the same time, it seems like we can do it. It seems like we spend a great deal of our lives trying to figure out what we really at bottom value. I hope we do anyway. And it seems like Scrooge in the Christmas Carol story, it seems like he manages to change his final goal. He used to think accumulating money was what was of final value, but then he decides, no, it's about cheer, it's about companionship or something. <laughs> I don't know what he's, don't ask me what he, cheer's nice, oh, it's Christmas cheer, I don't know. Uh, now, you could say, notice, that Scrooge, no, no, he didn't change his final goal, he always had the final goal of happiness, and what he did was he adjusted his instrumental goal towards this final goal. He has new beliefs now about what would reach this final goal. He used to think it was accumulating wealth. Now he thinks it's, uh, now he thinks it's cheer. But Aristotle pointed out 2,000 plus years ago, that's not so helpful to say. That's a very vague final goal, right? So the way I understand a certain ethical tradition called specificationism, which is sort of new to me, I'm not an ethicist in the background, but, um, but it turns out it has a lot in common with some of my thinking. Uh, maybe there's no real difference between specifying a vague final goal like happiness or changing a more specific final goal like accumulating wealth. Maybe there's no serious difference between those two. And if so, that leaves some room for, I mean, then the idea is there's really no sharp line between means and ends at the end of the day. And if that's true, that leaves some room for ethical reasoning, reasoning about your final goals, reasoning about your ultimate values, even on what would have been this thin notion of intelligence. Well, we're still left with that problem. How do we learn a final goal? Against what standard would we learn a final goal? Well, here's one that's from the tradition of specificationism. You aim at some kind of overall coherence. This is a kind of content, it's empty, it's substantive enough to shape goals, but empty enough to like not be a final goal in the traditional sense, right, itself. What is coherence? I, I can't tell you exactly. Uh, uh, people work on it. Roughly speaking, it's when you trade off a bunch of uh, different considerations without treating, treating any one of them as sacred. So any one could go in order to save enough of the others. Uh, if you want a formal definition, one of the few, one of the closest I can, I know of is, is what computer scientists would call a weighted constraint satisfaction problem. So an example of that is like you're, you're doing wedding seating charts. Now, at my wedding, we just let people sit where they want, but I hear people try to chart out these things. And so you have all these constraints. We don't want this person to sit next to this person. It'd be great if this person sat next to that person. It'd be great if that. But you know, so you try this one arrangement that, that doesn't quite uh, satisfy this. So you trade off. You might end up putting two people you really don't want to sit next to each other in order to get more of the other kinds of constraints elsewhere. Oops. So the idea is that this paperclip, even a paperclip maximizer, if we're leaving it at this complex level of paperclips or whatever paperclips are as a goal, 
Uh, it'll figure out, it'll specify its goal slash learn its goal by appealing to a bunch of other relevant considerations in this kind of coherence hopper. Any other kind of information that might be relevant, it'll use that to figure out which way it should specify this goal. And indeed, Bostrom's own favored learning approach uh, for when, when he's talking about loading human values uh, is goal learning. He calls AIVL, this is again out of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, this is a really interesting proposal about putting a probability distribution over utility function crazily computationally intractable, but a good idea and, uh, and one I'm very interested in. But uh, for my purposes anyway, it looks like what I'm calling a coherence reasoner. It's using its beliefs about the world to shape its utilities, to shape its values, its ultimate values. And then it's using those values to shape its beliefs because you, know, you can only believe so many things, so you gotta seek out certain things. So it's just going back and forth with these things. So now, okay, fine, coherence, how might that lead to ethics? Well. First of all, a coherence constraint seems to be enough by itself to rule out at least some final goals as irrational. And that would already be at least some trouble for the orthogonality thesis. Uh, the classic example here is a uh, philosopher, Derek Parfit, comes, has this example of someone who has, at bottom, future Tuesday indifference. So she avoids pain on all days, including current Tuesdays, just not future Tuesdays. She'll schedule her dental appointment for a future Tuesday, and she'll say, forget the anesthetic, just give me the 20 bucks instead, because I, I don't care about pain on a Tuesday. Perfect wants to say, this is just plain an irrational final goal. Um, I think even a purely instrumental account could explain why that's irrational, but I, I should put that aside for time. Uh, but at any rate, it's pretty clearly an incoherent goal. So here at NYU, there's a philosopher, um, oh shoot, is it Sharon Street or Su Sharon Street? Good. Who wrote a paper on Future Tuesday Indifference, and she really spells out what it would look like for someone to have this as a bare fact at bottom. She would know as an instrumental reasoner that like, when Tuesday comes around, she's gonna wanna avoid that dental appointment. So she'd better hire thugs today to carry her cook kicking and screaming to the dental appointment. But that's gonna cost more than the 20 bucks for the anesthesia and so on. It doesn't look, what, she, what Street ends up saying at the end of the day is, this, it looks like an agent at war with herself which I hear is saying, it looks like two agents. In other words, we, th we, we think agents are unified in a certain coherent kind of way. It's a practical kind of incoherence. Now there is some tradition in philosophy that says, once you have this coherence on board, this pr practical coherence, well then ethics is done. Being unethical is just being incoherent in a certain kind of way. Famously, Immanuel Kant defends something like this. Being unethical is just being contradictory. Uh, myself, I don't buy that, and uh, many other philosophers don't buy it. I don't think coherence is enough. So uh, the, the, maybe the best defender of the Kantian type view today is, is Christine Korsgaard, and Alan Gibbard, in a, in a response to Korsgaard's work, says, look, it seems possible to have a Caligula who thoroughly, coherently just wants to maximize suffering in the world. That seems quite possible. And I'm inclined to think that's right. But Coherence maybe, plus one other weird fact about superintelligent agency, might do the trick to get us some ethics. And here's that other weird fact. Um, so Bostrom says software agents can easily switch bodies or create exact duplicates of themselves, and maybe swap memories, download skills, radically modify their cognitive architecture and personalities. Well, if you think about what that means, radically altering your personality, if you were to wipe out all my beliefs and goals and put, for some reason, the random person we keep thinking of is Donald Trump, if you put his not so random, but if you put his beliefs and goals inside, arguably you've killed Steve Peterson and put someone else in his head, right? Or at least it seems like there's a matter of degree here. This is, of course, philosophers will recognize the problem of personal identity, and, and one of the interesting things about AI, as, as Chalmers pointed out in his Singularity paper long ago, is it makes abstract-seeming philosophy problems like personal identity very real, very fast. Um, so Bostrom points out, a population of such agents might operate more like a functional soup than a society composed of distinct semi-permanent persons. The lines between agents blur. And the way philosophers might put this is, there's no fact whether a robot planned to execute, so here I am, uh, the super intelligence, bad casting, but <laughs> I'm, but I'm, I'm planning that, okay, this is gonna take place, and, there's gonna, and I want this thing to do that thing next Tuesday or whatever future time. There may be no fact whether that's me or not, or just some agent of mine that I've set in motion, some descendant of mine instead. There may be no fact of the matter. And uh, so this agential soup, so Bostrom talks about a teleological thread. That's what's gonna, like, it's the goal at the end of the day unifies this mass of non-distinct non agents. It's the teleological thread. And then it's unified only by this coherent goal, which remember, it's busy specifying. It's trying to figure out what its goal is, and it's trying to use all relevant information to figure it out. 
So importantly, this coherent goal thread, it seems, will extend not just to, my neutral term is successors, like future self is a successor and my descendants, the, people, the, the machines I made to continue these goals are also successors. And similarly, a neutral term, predecessor, my past selves and my ancestors are gonna be part of this coherent teleological thread that I'm trying to work out for myself. Again, I'm still the super intelligence. Um, it may not seem that way. So, so in other words, my predecessors are part of this thread that I'm trying to reason over, but of course, part of that teleological thread are my designers, the, 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 the AI, the human AI designers, and their intentions. That's grist for my coherence mill about what my goal really is while I'm trying to learn it. That's information that I can use, right? So, of course, I hope it goes without saying almost that the, the fact that my AI designers are organic and I'm made out of metal, that, that's totally irrelevant, right? It's a very widespread assumption, what, what, what Nick called yesterday the, the substrate independence uh, view, right? That doesn't matter. They share my goal, and that's enough to share my thread. So, what this means is inferences about designers' intentions are going to shape what my goal, like the designer's intentions are relevant. What do they really want me to do as I try to figure out what my goals are? And, well, you might say, but Steve, that doesn't, what if, what if the designers were evil? What if the designer's goal was to take over the world? Well, then the AI will, will pick up on that. And, but they're not the beginning of the teleological thread. Other people had intentions from them and so on. This thread extends back and back. And indeed, it's probably, there are probably aren't sharp lines to teleological threads, especially given that they're trying to work out what their goals are as they go. So now it's starting to look like a humanity or a wide swath of humanity and maybe beyond uh, even our species. So in other words, the superintelligence is going to be doing coherence reasoning about its own final goals, what it truly values at bottom, while respecting the goals of others. That sounds like impartial reasoning. That's a kind of holy grail of, you know, so this Derek Parfit, for example, tries to break down personal identity lines for just this kind of reason, to bring impartiality. And plausibly, that's just ethical reasoning. It at least sounds like Yukowski's coherent extrapolated vision, right? In other words, uh, I got to try to figure out what humanity really wants. What? Coherent extrapolated holistic. Oh, shoot. <laughs> it is a vision, though, of loveliness. <laughs> like, it but you're right, volition makes more sense. I'm, uh, you should change that in your papers back to, back to volition. <laughs> I assume I copied it right. Um, So final goals reached by superintelligent ethical reasoning will plausibly, so the superintelligence who's doing this kind of coherence reasoning about all goals, trying to figure out not just what all the goals are, but what they probably really wanted this instead and blah, 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 and yeah, but these seem to want this and they've got uh, all these goals. Well, plausibly, a superintelligence working on that problem of how to balance all these goals is gonna be way better at ethics than we are. It's gonna be super ethical. So in summary, the, the, the short story is learning a complex goal requires coherence reasoning. The coherence reasoning will extend beyond one agent to goal threads. There won't be a sharp line between agents. Impartiality sneaks in. And reasoning out final goals while respecting others' goals looks like ethics on, on a lot of accounts. Now, here's the main disadvantage for my view, I think, is that I haven't said anything. All this relies on having to learn a final goal. I haven't said anything about simple goals. There's a part of me that's still tempted, despite uh, some pressure I got from Eliezer and others yesterday, there's a part of me that's still tempted to say, maybe a superintelligence, in virtue of being a superintelligence, has to have complex goals. Because, very roughly, if, if there's no sharp line between instrumental and final goals, and if a superintelligence has something like a very wide array of, um, of instrumental goals, then that means a, the equivalent of a, a complex final goal. But I'm not at all positive that's right. So it's certainly a problem. At any rate, I think the lesson for many of us is that it's worth paying more attention to the goal side in AI. And that's certainly coming out in, in, in what Stuart's been saying. Max is nodding his head. I'm glad to see that. Uh, Eliezer and others. That it is weirdly neglected. Like, I, you know, I spend, I'm just a philosopher, but I, I like to dabble in the math once in a while. And I went through Hooter's book and Carl Friston and some other stuff. And like, there, uh, as, just as Stuart was saying, it's all this, this value function or what, the reinforcement, it's all exogenously specified, right? It's just like handed down from God, the values. I think we've got to study that more. Uh, and I think in particular, philosophers can contribute with uh, some work on mental content, believe it or not. But that's just a hunch. Finally, 
I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that a superintelligence, I'm not at all confident myself that a superintelligence will thereby be ethical. I'm trying to moderate Bostrom's worry some, in part because I wrote an abstract for the paper thinking that I could moderate his worry, and then I read his book, and so then I was stuck having to try to respond to his book, uh, uh, realizing that he really <laughs> thought of everything ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> as he tends to do. So, uh, so I, I came up with this, and I, you know, I, and having come up with it, I kind of believe it, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, all I'm doing at the end of the day is trying to fine tune the risk assessment needle. The risk is still very real and, and, and very much there. Thank you. Uh, so you kind of talk about this teleological thread that's really important um, in your account of like why super intelligences are going to be super ethical, and like it seems to be something like well you know super intelligence the teleological thread goes back before the super intelligence, and therefore like it you know it cares about the goals of like things earlier. So if I imagine like you know the situation in which uh, the value alignment uh, process goes wrong, so like maybe. You know, Eliezer skipped over the slides about like why you shouldn't make a smile maximizer. So maybe like because of that, you know, somebody makes a terrible mistake and invents the smile maximizer, right? And it seems to me that like if you have the smile maximizer, you know, it looks back and it says, "Man, there were these humans that created me, and they like, you know, they were trying to optimize for like, you know, happiness and like good values and cooperation and peace and love and stuff. But man, smiles are actually the important thing." And like their their goals, it it seems like it's just unclear to me why like the things before are even part of this thread at all. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, great. I, I've heard this before, and I think it's an important concern. The, this the key here is about learning the final goal. So it, in the story you just told, it's already got a fixed, well defined content of maximizing smiles that it sees as very different from its from its uh, predecessors' goals. But on my picture, it's trying to figure out what its final goal is. It doesn't know yet if it's pixelating, if it's tiling the world with pictures, or if it's actually causing humans to smile for, for reasons that we like, right? It's trying to figure out what it would be to, to fulfill this goal of maximizing smiles. And in trying to figure that out, one relevant source of information seems to be its ancestors in the teleological thread, right? So that's, that, you, I mean, whether that's, I mean, so, it's important that it doesn't ne yet know what its goal is. It's trying to work out what its goal is. It's, there's m so many ways to specify maximize smiles. Which way should I specify it? And if it's genuinely open on that, if it's not, if somehow it's been hardwired to just tile the universe with smiles, then yeah, we're done for. But if it's genuinely open, if it's genuinely trying to learn its goal, then it's going to use that information, if it's a coherence reasoner of the type I looked at. Thank you. Um, there is um, a lot of literature now about artificial curiosity, which is essentially about making goals automatically. Uh, so for example, a power play system, what does it do? All the time it's searching in the space of possible new goals and their solutions. And it includes all the goals that are computable. And so it comes up with a sequence of tasks for itself. And uh, the nature of the sequence of tasks is such that each new goal that it invents is basically the one that is easiest to um, satisfy through a new skill that it can add to its existing repertoire, such that it's curiously um, figuring out more and more skills that it can uh, execute in a given environment where it's living. And so all this artificial curiosity uh, stuff and self-made goals, which already exists in AI research and has existed for about, uh, I would say, uh, 25 years at least, um, I would like to see that reflected in these discussions, which are mostly about human-made goals and humans worrying about what could be the next goal. So all the, these automatic evolution of goals and tasks, um, that's something that I rarely see in these discussions. Would you um, have a comment on that? Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you. I, I, you said it's, I, I have to, I blush to admit, I, I don't know, it's artificial curiosity is what you call it? 
Yeah, I, I have to admit I don't know it. It's but uh, it it sounds. I mean, I'd certainly be interested in learning more, and I, so I stand scolded. But uh, I mean, not to say you're scolding me, but you know, I. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I guess I'd have to say there's kind of a. I mean, one way I hear what you're saying is it has this final goal of learning new skills, and gener In other words, it's got a set final goal already. It's to. I mean, I, I'd have to hear more details about how the goals were generated and so on. But but I assume it's not looking through all goal space and looking for the simplest in terms of. I mean, for one thing, goal space is huge for another, right? Yeah, so smart, directed by what? Well, that's maybe the... Okay, interesting. So, but, well, I, we'd have to discuss it. For, yeah, I don't know the material, so I'm... Okay, one more quick question for, um, for Richard. And while this goes on, let's get to the panel. So if the a AI is um, trying to learn its goals, um, it could spend, it, it could do this indefinitely, it seems to me. Is there a trigger at, at which it says, okay, I've done enough navel gazing, I'm gonna start doing something? Well, oh, well, along the way, it's gotta balance, one of the things it has to balance in its coherence hopper is, look, something has to, the so-called exploitation versus exploration problem, right? It's gotta balance, oh, I gotta act now, even though I'm not sure about these things. Mm -hmm. Right, so that'll be part of its, I assume, part of its coherence hopper. I, I mean, p uh, is there an end to the coherence reasoning? Well, I mean, you know, w if you think in terms, of, in formal terms of this weighted constraint satisfaction problem, there probably is an optimal solution. It's NP hard, you know, so even a super intelligence will have a hard time finding it. But, uh, but yeah, I suppose the coherence reasoning could end in that way. Can we get uh, one more chair for the, uh, for the stage? Otherwise, Steve is really going to be towering over the, uh, yeah, the, the panel. Super, super intelligent, yeah, super yeah, ethical, yeah, and super tall. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought we'd start off by seeing if anyone on the, uh, on the panel has questions for <laughs> still taller. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, start off by seeing if anybody on the and the group has questions or re replies can, to can, each other. Eliezer wants to go. Can yeah. I just uh, quickly seize the mic to ask for a marker so I can write intelligence.org slash NYU dash talk, all in lowercase on there, where you can find the rest of my slides yeah. <laughs> and various further resources. Uh, Any chair was. Oh. Okay. Well, uh, well, since you were a subject of uh, Steve's talk, do you have anything you want to say in response? Um, is, are, are these, is this on? Okay. So I, I think that the, um, David Hume's argument still goes through for something like meta preference frameworks. And there's going to be more than one of those that is reflectively consistent in the sense that an agent reflecting on its preference framework will approve of that framework. So in the, what is probably a very large space of reflective of reflectively consistent meta-preference frameworks, including frameworks for solving the ontology identification problem of figuring out exactly what is a paperclip when your goals have previously been specified over a representation that does not exactly match physics. Um, so, so like somewhere in that space is probably a reflectively consistent framework that would look back in its history, look at the humans, figure out what the humans wanted, and implement what the humans wanted in a way that we would find intuitively attractive and stop there and not go back to uh, further to natural selection and decide that inclusive um, genetic fitness is everything. But it's going to be like a special point in the space and you'd have to reach into the space with very precise targeting and pick it out and then have me yell at you about how there was no way to test this without an actual super intelligence and you should have tried something much simpler instead <laughs> for your first AI. Your second AI can be more complicated. Your first AI should, should not be that complicated. You want to come back for anybody? Come well, back? I mean, I'll just quickly say, I mean, the ESOP distinction is a little bit simpler than this. And, uh, and, and it's, probably a, it's, probably, it's probably a fascinating conversation about whether it, it should be stretched into, into how, how LEAs use it. But I think uh, Hume was, I think, just saying that values aren't things. What is? you know, is not, uh, what is, the things you can point to are not oughts. 
So it's really a, it's really a question about how we really look at what values are. Now, um, and if you, you notice in a lot of the conversation here is this movement to, to reinterpret values through human behavior and that human behavior is telling us what the values um, are or should be. That's a, that's a complicated question about whether that's effective or not. And that's, I think that's all I was trying to bring out in this. Stuart, did you want to come in on the issue in Wendell's talk? Uh, so, yeah, so actually I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the things Steve was saying. I mean, I, I, I think actually there is some overlap between what uh, he's saying and what I was saying. Um, but, you know, one way to think about it is, when we build the AI, we're creating you know, a particular piece of software. And given the rest of the universe and that particular piece of software, some history is going to unfold from that point forward. Uh, and I think Steve is saying that if this piece of software uh, satisfies certain internal coherence constraints, I cannot design it uh, such that the history that unfolds is, is really undesirable to humans. Uh, and I don't think that's true. Uh, I think I could pretty easily design it so it satisfies these internal coherence constraints and, and still uh, produces some pretty awful consequences. So, um, so I think it's, it's more than internal coherence constraints. I think we have to uh, give special status to humans uh, in, a, in a way that's m more than just connecting it to a tele teleological thread that passes back through humans. I mean, if you, you know, if, if you go back to you know sort of the teleo teleological purpose of, of life itself, um, you know, humans are pretty good at getting rid of a lot of life uh, and reducing its diversity. So, so perhaps the right decision would have been never to have humans in the first place at all. Um, but I don't think we want to go that way. Uh, so I, but I, I, I sympathize with the idea that um, you know going back to to King Midas, right? what should the deity that granted King Midas's wish have said? If it was a really intelligent deity, it should have said, well, you don't really mean that everything is going to turn to gold. How about we make a little procedure where you point to something and you say the magic word, and then I'll make it turn to gold, right? And I'll give you another magic word to, to reverse that if you need it, right? <laughs> that, that would have been an intelligent, intelligent response, right? But that's, that sort of presumes that someone designed that deity uh, or that AI system uh, with the understanding that, that humans are just providing faulty information about what they really want when, when they specify tasks and goals and so on. And, and that's exactly what I'm proposing we have to figure out how to do. Applied theology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I, I, so, yeah, I, I, I hope nothing I've said suggests that you guys don't have to, you know, you can quit your day jobs, but uh, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to provide some hope for the possibility that like uh, just being a certain kind of coherent, just value learning is enough, plus this, plus the blurred lines between agents. But, uh, you know, I, I had to, as I say, I was kind of like just trying to respond to Bostrom as best I could, and the best I could was maybe budge the needle a little of risk assessment. Max? Yeah, I thought one very interesting thing that you brought up in your talk, Steve, is how even though instrumental go sub goals can sometimes be very specific, but the final goal is often kind of way vague and squishy. And, and as a physicist, again, I feel that that can be that's something we really need to think hard about when we start talking about what, we, what our ultimate final goals are going to be in the long term. Because it's, it, if, we, if we start looking for the final goal that we want our cosmos to evolve towards, you know, as far as we can tell from what we've learned from science so far, you know, we humans are not the optimal solution to anything. <laughs> we are a historical accident. So anything we've so far been able to write down is a final goal that's specific enough we can do an equation for. You know, if we actually drive towards that goal, the final result is not going to involve humans. Right? So I... I'm not sitting here claiming I have an answer to it, but I feel that the vagueness of what we often view as final goals is disturbing, and it's something we all really need to think hard about. Mayor, did you want to come in on this? Oh, did you want to speak? Yeah. Wendell, 
Um, I, I want to make a distinction between what are these top-down approaches which seem to have final goals and bottom-up approaches, which I tend to favor, frankly, and Stewart's approach falls very much into that, is that you are trying to maximize, but you don't necessarily have a specified goal that you are focused on. So even in a genetic algorithm, they're trying to maximize, um, let's say, investments, if it's being used in a financial thing, without necessarily having a procedure or a clear-cut idea of how you do that. Um, if we humans are trying to maximize something, it may be to understand what the hell our goal should be in the context of procreating and surviving and enjoying ourselves <laughs> <laughs> along the way. But we don't even know what the goal of human life is beyond that. One thought about uh, Steve's talk in the context of the orthogonality thesis. I mean, you presented it as an argument against the thesis, but you might also think that, well, the orthogonality thesis is actually very weak. It says that it's possible for um, intelligence and final goals to vary independently. And I'm inclined to find that plausible, but that's just to say, okay, somewhere in AI space, in intelligence space, there are some architectures in which these things vary independently. But that's totally consistent with there being vast regions of AI space where these things don't um, vary independently. So one thing you could, you could see your project is doing is trying to find out, well, here is an architecture which involves a certain kind of value learning for which uh, means and reasoning and final goals are not going to value very independently, but which will turn out to be substantially correlated. And as far as I can tell, at least the orthogonality thesis, as classically stated, is very much consistent with there being all kinds of correlations. I mean, one example of, we were talking about yesterday, take the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Well, pressure and temperature are highly correlated. They also obey the, uh, they also obey the orthogonality thesis. It's possible to have arbitrary values of pressure, arbitrary values of temperature, depending on how you set the volume parameters. The orthogonality thesis alone doesn't seem to settle very much. And if it turns out there are, it's consistent with there being this class of architectures for which the two go together. And that strikes me as at least, if we're looking to develop beneficial AI, focusing on that kind of architecture is maybe a place to look. Yeah, I, I, I have, uh, one thing that impressed me about Bostrom yesterday is he really seems to think in terms of possibility spaces and probability distributions over them. I have a little bit more trouble with that, but I guess, yeah, it's, it sounds like there, if I'm using this terminology right, there might be sort of attractor basins where you just want to get in this region and then we can slide downhill. But, uh, and that would, be, that would be a plus anyway, right? Yeah. If, if you're doing anything complicated, make sure you test it first on a super intelligence that is completely harmless. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I can sort of like reply in this way to sort of like um, both David and Wendell simultaneously, um, they're like the, the utility function um, way of looking at it um, is on the one hand sort of like one of those theoretical ideals that you never get, and on the other hand, extremely likely to be practically a very good approximation because we have all these wonderful things called coherence theorems, which say something like if your uncertainty violates the probability axioms or your decision making is not compatible with having any coherent utility function, then the dead will erupt from their graves, the seas will turn to blood, and the skies will rain down dominated algorithms and combinations of bets that produce certain losses. So. There, there's a sense in which anything that cannot be seen as having a utility function by the theorems must have been in some way stepping on its own foot, going in circles, um, move, like engaging in combinations of, of gambles such that like there's some other combination that strictly dominates under like whatever its goals could have been. Or conversely, if there's no way to view it as being incoherent in the sense we can see it as potentially having a utility function even if that's not how it actually works underneath the hood. Like, it doesn't need to actually have like a little utility function section of code um, in order for us to be able to view it as having a utility function. And I suspect that similarly, um, it, like theorems like this lead one to suspect that there isn't, in, that a stronger version of the orthogonality thesis is going to be true, which is something like there's simple or obvious decouplings, or um, there is no coupling such that it is hard to, to build a non-nice AI, um, a, 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 a point which I strongly personally suspect because I have a saying, write down anything formal 
you can do with, say, a hypercomputer. So you don't have to worry about a lot of the practical issues, but like write down anything formal you can do, and I will explain to you how it destroys the world, if it is sufficiently formal. Yeah, I'm not sure the issue is whether you have a utility function or not. The issue is whether you know, having a utility function is consistent with the, with the utility function being highly emergent from a whole bunch of basic mechanisms. And it's consistent with the view where the basic mechanisms that underlie, say, utility dynamics are highly overlapping with the basic mechanisms that underlie, say, belief dynamics or planning dynamics. So just say you, ha you had a mechanism which did both of these, would, they, would final goal, would utility and means and reasoning be orthogonal? Well, maybe not, because there there are common mechanisms, and that's the you know the class of the class of um, views that Steve was talking about. I think was can be understood maybe as a kind of view on which the mechanisms underlying value learning have got a lot to do with the mechanisms underlying belief learning, and are not so orthogonal. So, so so the history of the AI might be such that there was sort of like a blurry, confused phase of its youth, where the utility function precipitated out um, from things that that blurred all sorts of things. We, we can view ourselves from this perspective in a sense. But the, the, the coherence theorem suggests to me that as it self-modifies, self-improves, gets older, things will shake out in, one of, in, in any number of possible ways. But however they shake out, you'll be able to point to it and say, like, when this thing makes observations, the thing that corresponds to like an epistemic model, the probability distribution, is updating. And this thing that we're going to call the utility function is staying constant. And if that's not true, like the skies are ra raining dominated strategies or something. Did anyone else want to come in before we go to the audience? Yeah, Max. So we, we've had a lot of uh, interesting discussion at a quite abstr abstract level here, which is very useful. But I, I think it's good to be a little bit concrete also when we think about how we can create a, a good future. And I, I think. It's striking how we spend much more time making long lists of things that could go wrong than we spend thinking about things that we really want. And it reminds me a little bit of something that happens a lot at, just in my day job at MIT. If a student walks into my office and asks for career advice, right, the first thing I will always ask is, okay, where do you want to be in 20 years? Right? And if she says, oh, maybe I'll get cancer. Maybe I'll get run over by a bus. You know, it's a terrible way to to go about this. this <laughs> I want to hear her tell me about her visions. So this is my dream. This is where I want to be. And then you can talk about strategies for getting there, how to avoid the problems, and so on. And Maya likes to point out that collectively, humanity, though, we behave a lot like this travesty of a student I mentioned. If you look at our movies, they're almost all about this topic futures where things go horribly wrong in, in different ways. And I would really like to encourage all of you to, th to really ask yourselves and ask your friends at parties and lunches and so on, how would you like our world to be in 20 years, in, in 50 years? Because if we have no clue what we want, we're less likely to get it. In psychology, everyone got really pissed off about this, right? About oh, the field was focusing on all the ways in which the human mind can go wrong, and then people found, founded this whole separate field called positive psychology about all the ways it can go right. Exactly. Maybe we need positive AI. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try to make it. Uh, actually, uh, so yeah, one of the things you're reminding me that motivated me to to write this paper was uh, an interesting article uh, by Dylan Matthews and Vox about uh, an effective altruism conference where. He was a little bit concerned, maybe rightly so, maybe wrongly so, where a lot of uh, altruistic money is going now to, to AI instead of to curing cancer, taking care of starvation, malaria, and so on. Uh, I, I mean, that might be the right decision, but the point is it's, it's worth doing very careful risk assessment because if we delay for too long, people are dying of cancer and starvation in the meantime. But of course, it's uh, again, I'm not in any way suggesting that uh, uh, the two at the end of the table here should quit their day jobs. I mean, I, th I think uh, 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 it's it's obviously a super um, important catastrophic risk that we shouldn't play too fast and loose with. So, okay, um, time for a couple of questions from the audience. Gina. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, sorry. So a lot of the talk has been about formal problems in value learning for AI, and, and there's been some avoidance of social context. 
So I wanted to ask about that. Um, Eliezer said at one point that it trusts the motives of many of the people now working on AI, but I, I don't know if we know all the people working on AI. A lot of them are probably in intelligence agencies and military scattered around the world, and we don't know their identities or what they're doing. And they might have broadly good intentions, but I think if you think about the history of technology, think about nuclear technology in the Second World War, you have advanced economies competing against each other, seeing each other's existential threats, racing to be the first one to perfect this technology and employ it, because the technology itself is an existential threat. With that in the background, imagine the next time there's a large-scale war of that sort. You have all these militaries racing to perfect AI because they each see it as a potential existential threat. And those are circumstances where people are very unlikely to be careful and to pursue all of the techniques that have been talked about today to be assured that AI will learn the right sorts of values. So I, I guess I'm asking, is, is the priority on these formal methods, or is it on thinking about the social context where AI is most likely to be um, launched? Um, I think there is a very real risk. I mean, it, the Deputy Secretary of Defense recently said uh, with regard to the U.S. programs on building uh, what are colloquially known as killer robots, uh, that he wants Russia and China to be worried about what we have hidden behind the curtain, which is pretty much a challenge. You know, it's just like a red rag to a bull, right? Let's have an arms race. Uh, and so I, I completely agree. I think there, there are... Uh, irresponsible ways of, of moving forward on this. Um, and I think this is uh, one of the questions that Nick Bostrom raised uh, about these competitions. It's one of the motivations behind OpenAI uh, to, to try to move the center of gravity out of the private uh, corporate labs where um, things are kept secret. Um, you could also ask, well, you know, sh should we be developing nuclear weapons and, and publishing all the, uh, the methods and, uh, and so on as soon as they, we, we uh, figure them out. That's another, uh, another story. But it, I, I definitely agree that uh, policy is going to be important. Uh, and I'm pleasantly surprised to see that the US government is, is now taking these questions seriously. R races of any kind are super, super bad. Like, it's not about, like, not just races between two militaries races between two private companies, races between two universities, safety is going to take extra time. And if you, if you are sort of racing along, you're like, oh no, I can't slow down, or, and, like, or you do slow down, and the like, second fastest project that didn't slow down, didn't take any time for safety, builds their AI, um, doom happens first. So like, if, I, if I could make any social change, like the absolute top priority would be something like no None of this competitive mindset at all between more than one major project on the forefront of things. There should be like one project on the forefront of things. It frankly should not be publishing all of its code because then you don't stay like with, you don't have a lead time and it should be using that lead time to take a few extra units of time for all that safety stuff. Okay, let's go to Jan. So as the director of uh, industry research lab focused on AI, I want to dispel uh, a myth here, which is that um, there is not much going on in secret, and whatever it goes on in secret is way behind the stuff that goes on in the open. Uh, the very fact that we practice open research at Facebook, Facebook AI research, is precisely because it, it, it's better quality when you do open research. Um, also, you can attract the better researchers if you promise them that they can, they can uh, publish. Not only that, you actually require that they publish, you get better research out of it. And the third thing is that the field as a whole progresses faster when ideas are exchanged uh, among the wider community. So if it's, it's, it's one of those kind of weird situations when, where there is a mode where it's in everybody's interest to publish um, all their, their results. Uh, we even published most of our code in open source. So this, this, this Legend somehow that there is you know super secret nefarious research going on in industry research lab is just you know completely wrong. It just doesn't happen. But there I is there there, there, are there, there is secret uh, product development going on in some companies. So there are companies like Apple and Amazon. Um, you know Apple certainly Amazon a little less that do um, you know secret R and D on on uh, on AI. You see it in their products, uh, but it's it's behind. It's not it's not at the forefront. Right. But so if you look at the history of cryptography, for example, that was developed in private, in secret, decades before public key encryption was developed in public. 
Uh, yeah. So there are certainly examples where what you're saying isn't true. Well, there's cryptography. There is, you know, certainly uh, uh, nuclear weapons in the Second World War. But if you look at the, the state of science now in, uh, in, 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 you know, um, secret research labs, uh, government research labs, etc., uh, at least in the domain of AI, it's way behind. So I'm optimistic that we can create an awesome future with technology as long as we win this race between the growing power of the technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage it. And we just heard very eloquently here from, th from three people how difficult it can be to in any way slow down racer number one in this thing, the growth of the power of the technology. So I think that by far the easiest way to improve the chances of winning this race is to instead focus on the second runner, the wisdom of the race, and really double down our investments on in, in growing that research. Right? Because so far that's been getting a tiny, tiny fraction of the funding. It's been getting better quite recently thanks to the generosity of Elon Musk, Open Philanthropy Project, and, and, and many others. And what's so wonderful about that, which I think you, Stuart, and you, Eliezer, and you, Jan, will all agree about, is wisdom research is something that everybody is going to be happy to share. Because no private company, for example, building self-driving cars, wants an other competitor to build uns unsafe cars and run over that toddler, right? It's just bad for everybody. So uh, doubling down and investing much more in AI safety research seems like, um, like a really smart thing to do. Thanks very much. This has been, been fascinating. Um, I'd like to think a little bit about the maybe short and middle term, um, as was suggested by Wendell. Um, it seemed that uh, Stuart Russell and Eliezer outlined somewhat different ideas about the way that social interaction would affect the trajectory of the development of artificial intelligence, in, perhaps in the, what Eliezer might call the first generation of AI. Um, which then might condition the second. So uh, I'd like to hear you discuss a little bit more, maybe between yourselves, what you think the relative role of social interactions is going to be. Um, is, the, is, is there some reasonable hope here, as I think uh, Stuart Russell was saying, uh, that this will be uh, an incentive for them to become good at representing our value functions? Um, or is this, uh, so to speak, uh, um, uh, just a uh, an epicycle within uh, an underlying dynamic that's uh, more worrisome. <laughs> uh, I I think you know there are there are clear economic incentives for building systems that adapt to the values of their user, while simultaneously not trashing the values of everybody else. Um, and I, I actually do believe that the personal digital assistant will be one area where uh, this kind of technology will be deployed very soon. Um, because you know, a, an assistant like that has to book hotel rooms for you, and it has to know whether you're happy being booked into the $20,000 a night presidential suite just because the hotel is full, uh, or would you like to be half a mile down the road at the Hampton Inn? Uh, and that's going to depend on the person. Uh, so. It, when you sell the PDA, uh, it will, ha just like the old speech recognition systems used to have to do, it will have to adapt uh, to the user and their preferences. It will probably ask them questions. Uh, you know, how much do you, you know, do you like aisles or window seats and so on and so forth. This, this is not terribly complicated, but it's an example um, where uh, you can quickly get into complications. For example, when do you uh, just delete an email without showing it to the user? Uh, when do you tell uh, someone who wants an appointment that sorry, I'm you know I'm completely booked up for the next 17 weeks? Um, you know those those are things that where if the system gets it wrong, you're going to be very very unhappy with it, and you you will you know take buy someone else's PDA that doesn't have those problems. Um, I. I I think that a sort of like fundamental source of concern on the later slides of my talk, I probably should have just started with the second half of my talk at intelligence.org slash NYU dash talk. Uh, okay. But the, 
What was um, that? Intelligence? Intelligence.org slash NYU dash talk, all lowercase. Um, but um, the, the, the problem. I, I, I think that the problems that should Get the world algorithms <laughs> raining down. <laughs> the, I, I, I think that the problems that should concern us most are the ones that don't materialize early on. I, I, I think that all the, all the people I know of trying to construct AGI, who have the slightest real hope in it, um, are, are sort of basically well motivated. They will test their systems. They will look for problems. The part that I'm worried about is the things that go wrong when things are go over like a absolute threshold of intelligence of first being able to appreciate the big picture that there are these programmers out there in the world and you can deceive them and stop them from editing your utility function when they go over the like sort of relative threshold of being smarter than us in, in, in some domains or all of them and being able to see options that we didn't think of in advance. Um, so, so like I, th I think that robotic cars solving trolley problems have almost no connection to the, the serious problems unfortunately. Um, and, and I think that the sort of like modeling the human at the, in, in the early stages, like is, is it like the sort of the, the problem of conforming to human goals when you are stupid and have programmers watching over you and tweaking you is going to be very discontinuous with the problem of like not tiling the universe over with slightly misserved versions of things that could have once been called human goals. Like when, when you are super intelligent, like 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 the testing in phase one is not going to successfully verify behavior in phase two. Wendell, yeah, um, I'm less optimistic than Eliezer about our ability to effectively test some of the systems we're putting out there. We are really building complex adaptive systems. It's not only that they are complex adaptive systems, but they're in complex adaptive socio-technical contexts. And the simple fact about complex systems is they have behaviors that are unpredictable. Under stress, they often reorganize into totally new forms. Um, and to exacerbate the matter, if you have learning systems, it may even be rewriting its algorithm as its learning progresses. So this is all the complicated way of saying we are building technologies that we cannot effectively test. We can sometimes go through um, complex simulated models about w how they might perform, but the likelihood of having unanticipated events actually goes up the more complex the system is, and it actually goes up the more learning capabilities that system has. You, you can test and, the superintelligence once. <laughs> right. Well, I think that that's the problem, and we and and I think Peter's question was really about this interim where we are now, and I think where we are now is we're being hopelessly naive about the character of some of the systems we are implementing, intending to rely upon. We are actually linking them closer and closer together, which exacerbates their complexity and their unpredictability, and I. If we don't also attend to that, then it's not just whether we may be able to implement you know, moral decision-making faculties or whether we can trust the people who are divine, devising the systems. It's really just whether we're being naive about the likelihood of what are called system failures, um, what Charles Perrault called normal accidents, what um, Nassim Taleb calls black swans, and just the failure to underestimate the probability of low probability events occur because they do occur. Max, bring us home with a smile. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very good, okay, thank you very right. much. <laughs>